This week's episode is sponsored by HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supply company in Scotland, where you can buy your whole kitchen online with all the prices on show, no gimmicks, just straightforward good deals for high quality kitchens and appliances. You can buy your kitchen from the comfort of your own home instead of getting pestered by pushy salespeople. Check out HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supplier in Scotland. You and your wife were on your last £27? Yeah, we were and, down to 27 quid. And you've yep. turned it into a multi-million dollar and million pound yeah. industry. Literally, people said, how do you celebrate? We had a curry and I had a Cadbury's cream egg. <laughs> and I, I remember, say, standing on Necker Island and Richard was very gracious. He let us have his room on Necker Island. So I stood on Necker and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, God, this is like, not just Necker, this is like Richard's room on Necker. How did the plane crash? How did that come about? We were probably about two minutes away from Coventry in flying time and we're at 3,000 feet or whatever we are, and all of a sudden there's this like <laughs> like that. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound good. And uh, John was good as gold. He didn't say a word to us. He kind of taps a few mm -hmm. dials and gauges. Yeah, and uh, before, we, and then he just says, mayday, mayday, mayday. <laughs> Boom, we're on. <laughs> Today's guest, we've got Mr. Grenade, Alan Barrett. How are you, brother? Nicely said, I'm very good, thanks. It's Nicely good to... pronounced Barrett. 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 Yeah, a lot of R's in there. There's a lot of R's. Yeah. How have you been? <laughs> yeah, good, very yeah. good. Yeah, I'm quite tired. There's been a lot of podcasting, a lot of filming, a lot of content, a mm -hmm. lot of stuff going on. Uh, but it's all good fun, so every day is a new day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I try and get a decent night's sleep. and what line podcasting, up. people cutting my grass, Alan. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, you've got a competition. Yeah. I know this is a good one, so I'm looking yeah, forward to this what? one. Um, Anything so, goes. A man who started the Grenade Bar, the most selling bar of chocolate in the UK, biggest selling. Yeah, so we're now, uh, yeah, as of last year, actually, we're now the number one selling, I mean, we've been the number one selling mm -hmm. protein bar in the UK for years, but that wasn't that difficult because mm -hmm. it's not that big an industry. But when we found out we'd kind of made the top five in fact we found out we were in the top 15 selling chocolate bars we started to get quite exciting because you sort of think it's this mythical astronomical number which don't get me wrong it is but if someone had said to me years ago i mean even five years ago let alone 10 or 15 years ago you know you'll you'll be selling more protein bars in the uk in, in grocery channels than you know mars sell mars bars i've just mm -hmm. said you know, no chance. Mm -hmm. And just interesting, sign of the times, sugar's the enemy. Um, a lot of the big FMCG brands, uh, you know, who we, we look up to and admire. You know, I'm not bashing any chocolate companies. I, I admire these companies. You know, I grew up on Cadbury's uh, just up the road from me. Um, but I think, you know, times have changed and now is the time of the entrepreneur. It's the time of the scale up business, the mm -hmm. challenger brand, ankle biters, we're always called. Yeah. I was called an ankle biter once. Mm -hmm. I think well, that could have come from Mars. And I quite like the expression ankle biter because it kind of made us sound scrappy and more of an yeah. annoyance. So I thought, okay, if you want us to annoy you, then we'll just sell more bars than you do. And we'll see yeah. how annoying, we'll you, see how annoying yeah. I am now. And you clearly have, especially got against the big brands who've been established for many, many years. You and your wife were on your last £27? Yeah, we were and, down to £27. Quid. And you've yep. turned it into a multi-million dollar and million pound yeah. industry, but the plan is to hit your billion mark, which I believe you're bang on course for. But we'll go right back to the start, Alan. I want to know how it all began and how you started getting into the entrepreneurial side of things. How far do you want to go back? Let's go right back I, to I, you were born. I can go back, I can go back <laughs> to when I was about 11. Let's okay, go so my family always worked for themselves. So I, I suppose I was probably destined to always work for myself. I think they were always fairly unemployable. Um, so I guess that's pretty made me fairly unemployable. And I've worked for the people over the years, but I think it was, yeah, I was probably always going to do something potentially for myself. So on my family side, they were heavy goods vehicle mechanics. Um, you know, they, they were kind of, my dad and his brother were, were born um, in the Second World War. And after the war, there was a lot of reconstruction and obviously a lot of austerity, a lot of poverty. And uh, they ended up starting a heavy goods vehicle. In fact, they were starting a mechanics business. It was really repairing cars because people were just getting cars for the first time. But everyone was doing it. 
and a lot of competition and there weren't actually many people driving cars so they tended to focus more on kind of heavy goods vehicles lorries big industrial stuff and they end up having this heavy goods vehicle mechanics business which they worked ridiculously hard at for decades and frankly just never made any money and to give you an idea of how hard they worked and, and how little they made my granddad so my dad's dad he went blind at work he was 82 and he, he died at work and even after he went blind he still went to work to hand him the tools so it's kind of sounds comical now but i'd watch him kind of trying to hand they sell you know pass me a spanner and he just pick up anything i mean it was just it was just like it was like a comedy show it was ridiculous um he died at work my dad's brother was 15 years older than him he died at work at 74 he never got married never left home never had kids he lived with his mom she he died first actually he died at home Fuck at 74 sick, she was man. she was 99 when her nan died and uh, I had to sort of say to my nan, oh, like, you know, your son's dead. I mean, you don't expect to bury your kids. Mm -hmm. And not when you're 99, perhaps. And, um, and she said, well, he wasn't old. I said, no, he's, he was. He was an old man. And he was like, he was 74. Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, that's not old. He went, no, it is old. You're really old. I mean, she remembered the Titanic sinking, you know, to put it in perspective. She was like, <laughs> she was like seven or eight when the Titanic sank because she was born in like 1905. Um, so... Uh, that kind of just left my, my dad and, and like I said they worked brutally hard very little money it was something I never ever ever wanted to do but I got the work ethic from them and I think if you can learn I mean obviously you've got to learn from your own mistakes and I know that's what the show's all about but if you can learn from someone else's mistakes mm -hmm. that's got to be better and I, I, I did see them put a lifetime of, of, of work in my uncle's case he had literally nothing to show for it you know, he never left home. I mean, it was actually, it was, it was kind of quite sad. When he passed away, we went around and sort of cleared out his bedroom and everything he'd accumulated over his life was in that one room and there was there was just nothing to show yeah. for it. And and I think something there really struck me. And I was always going to work hard and do something for myself, mm -hmm. but I just had to find yeah. what it was going to be. And I've got no interest in, I love cars and things like that, but I've got no interest in mechanics and how things work. My dad's quite mechanical and um, interested in engineering and that sort of stuff and quite good with his hands and I'm, I mean I'll, you would not want a wardrobe I'd put together I'm, I'm shit at it so um, unless it's made of protein yeah unless it's made of protein yeah we'll do protein wardrobe so uh, I uh, and I, I sort of my thing was, was going to the gym mm -hmm. so when I was 14 um, 15 well, in fact b backing up to finish the story about my, uh, my, my family so they used to do uh, repair work and MOTs and servicing on Cadbury's and Mr Kipling lorries back in the 80s and a lot of the times lorry drivers had, uh, would, would come in and they'd have a lorry full of cakes. And I was hanging around. So when they left, they didn't have a lorry full of cakes. Uh, and I was selling all the cakes at school. So uh, after so I got bored of eating them, basically. no, I didn't say I stole any. I mean, it was all it was all willing with their permission. They'd say, you know, help yourself. To be fair, a lot of the stuff was actually short dated or going out of date or out of date. And it was back then, you know, cakes had got like a week. Whatever makes you on. sleep at night, Alan, darling. <laughs> yeah, I probably. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not a thief. I'm not a monumental cake thief. Yeah, the grenade sales. Uh, well, I don't know who's told done. me the driver said it was okay. Uh, so that's um, exactly what my bank robber friends say when they're on the show. <laughs> they say it's it was fine, okay. They've yeah, got too much yeah. money. <laughs> if, if anything. I'm helping them I'm helping them. I'm helping them redistribute the money they're, they're grateful um, yeah so uh, I ended up um, taking a lot of these cakes to school I ate quite a lot but you soon get bored of it and um, yeah to be fair a lot of this stuff was kind of fairly short dated and dad, dad was a slow worker so if it went in short dated it was coming out and it was very out of date so they were just chucking them away so we would take them to school I remember taking actually the ends of the boxes where it was showed the stuff was out of date I was like ripping the ends of the boxes off so no one knew and I was flogging them at school and uh, I thought I was probably being dead clever. And uh, I got caught. And the <laughs> this sounds very soft, doesn't it, on Chan? We've interviewed people that work with the trays, the craze. And there, there, <laughs> there am I, I'm selling French fancies. Um, yeah, never going to be a hardcore criminal. Um, and I, I got in trouble at school for that. And they were going to expel me. And I sort of talked my way out of it. And I did them a deal. So the teachers got cakes and stuff. So however you look at it, I guess, from the age of 11, I was either a little shit or I was going to mm. end up in jail or I was going to end up kind of having my own mm -hmm. business and making money. Um, so that was the first, I guess, business I kind of had. And then when I was 14, uh, 15, um, I had a big scare. My dad was taken really ill. He had uh, meningitis. He had meningococcal septicemia, which is just a, a death sentence. It's incredibly rare in adults. It's the one that kids get. And it's just worse in adults. And uh, he was in intensive care for three weeks. And that was kind of a bit of a wake-up call as well, because, again, like I said, he got really nothing to show for it. And it would have just left, really, my mom, me, and my sister with kind of nothing and uh he's he was the only i don't know if this is still the case but back at the time he survived he was the only person he was written in the lancet as the only person to ever have this particular type of meningitis and survive so he kind of pulled through because he's a tough old bastard 
Um, and I think then that was around the time I was actually on work experience at the time in uh, in this this gym. I, did, I went to a gym called the Chapel Gym in Sturchley and they took me into the wing and I was really interested in training. And, uh, and that was the start of me actually going to the gym and starting to learn about supplements. And mm. that was my first involvement, I guess, into that gym, gym scene fitness industry. Yeah. So you say your family have died at work. Now I come in your office and you're, you're still working, even though you sold shares for over 70 million. Mm -hmm. Do you ever worry that you could potentially die at work if you get a, a finish line for yourself where you can get a feet up, retire and enjoy it? it because I know we talk about people overworking and nothing to show for it. And a lot of people think success is hard work, but it's, I know there's, nurses are the hardest workers in the world, but they don't get much paid for it. So you need to be careful where you're focusing your hard work into because there's plenty of hard workers out there who've proven to see that they don't get anything in return. But with you, you're clearly successful. You've got your vision to hit your, your billion dollar market yeah. with a protein bar which i believe you'll go on target for but does it scare you that you will overwork burn out and then potentially die yeah, at work? i mean definitely on the burning outside in fact i made a, a, a flippant comment to someone two days ago i said i won't make 50 um i'm 43 now i no, don't send that out to the universe Alan, no, man. I, do, do you know it, again it's um i'm one of those people i'm kind of all or nothing and i get you're very entrepreneurial you're probably very much the same if I'm going to do it, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very competitive. And if I'm in it, I'm in it. You know, if I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll do nothing. I had a, a business before I sold to actually had a distribution business um, before I set up Grenade and I sold that to set up Grenade. And in between setting Grenade, I had a few weeks off and I didn't get dressed for like three weeks. I didn't leave the house. Uh, I'm inherently quite lazy. So it does take quite a lot of discipline to kind of keep you pushing for what I have to have a big goal, I have to have something that motivates me. And it has to be something monumental that's not been done before, I think, mm -hmm. because I'm just, I'm never gonna be happy with mediocrity. Yeah. And you mentioned about success, you know, I don't, we don't really consider ourselves successful, but in, in terms of, certainly in terms of like, you know, the acquisition of stuff or wealth, cause it's just, it is meaningless. But we've always been, uh, I've always been happy and I've always been healthy. And if you're happy and healthy, then you are you're successful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you've definitely got to be, you know, I was all, we had nothing when I was a kid, but I was always happy with nothing. I didn't know any different. Mm. Uh, and I'm so glad that really we, we had nothing and we learned a lot and our parents worked really hard and, and gave us what they did. And I had a fantastic um, upbringing. It was very, very fortunate just in terms of, you know, they always gave us lots of love, lots of time as best they could. I only saw my dad one day a week because, uh, you know, because he worked. Uh, and I never really had that much in common with my dad, to be fair, until I bought my first car. And then I actually got something to talk to him about because he wasn't interested in training. Uh, I was interested in going to the gym and he just said, oh, you're wasting your life. It'll never do anything. You know, what's the point? Go and get a job. Um, you know, he, he'd, they'd have always been happy for me just to kind of go and do anything. If I just, yeah, if I'd have just been a van driver, he'd have mm. been, been happy. He hadn't really pushed me to want to do anything, which was fine. But luckily I kind of pushed myself. I think because the stuff I saw them do and i saw them as well always argue about money i always remember them arguing about money i remember thinking okay money's important because i don't want to i don't like arguing and you kind of then have it instilled in an early age well if you get money then there's you, you you've got everything there's nothing there's nothing mm -hmm. to argue about um and of course you know that's just that just isn't true yeah. all that does is just it gives you options and mm -hmm. frankly lots of people are probably better not off not having lots yeah. of options because it just complicates the matter. Yeah, do you think that was ingrained in you at a young age, not just the working mentality, but the fact that you needed money to try and make happiness in the family yeah. home especially? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, probably. And, and I think just to probably have stuff that we didn't have, um, but my friends probably had. You know, all my friends had computers. They were all going on holiday. You know, we, we'd go away to like a caravan on the south coast um, which, you know, by the age of kind of 15, 16, I was kind of fairly bored. All my friends were going to Florida and going abroad, and I'd never been abroad, I'd never been on a plane. Um, so I think, yeah, I always wanted to kind of go and do some of those things that my friends were doing. But then my mom had got osteo osteoporosis, still has, and she'd found it difficult to, to work just through ill health. But because I really wanted a computer, and they wanted to get me a computer, mm -hmm. and this was in like 1988, yeah. it, wasn't a, it was a Sega Mega Drive Master System, sorry. And, um, you know, she went back to work full time just so they could get me a computer. Mm -hmm. Makes me feel really selfish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've made it up to them yeah. since. I, d I did buy them a house. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> so, okay then, yeah. you know what I mean? So, 
it sounds as if you've been through a lot of trauma in your life as well, a lot of loss, Alan. Um, and you say that when you don't work, do you think if you stop working then depression kicks in? It's an interesting one. Uh, whether you'd call it depression or not, I mean, certainly the higher the high, the lower the low. And we've done, and we are doing, we have amazing highs. I mean, some of the stuff that we've done and we're doing, it's just never been done before. I mean, I'll, I'm going to give you an example. When I was 12 years old, I hated school. So when I was 12 years old, I bunked off school just to watch Richard Branson cross the Atlantic in the, in the Voyager, on the Voyager Challenge. It was pre-social media, and it was kind of a big deal. It was obviously a world record. The first one sank. It was the second one that was successful. And I, it was a, you know, I was looking at this guy who was you know, an entrepreneur. I didn't know what an entrepreneur was, but he was just doing things differently. Everyone liked him. He was making money. He was successful, and he was having fun. And, I, and I, that really resonated with me. And I bunked off school to watch him do it. And I said to myself, one day, I'm, I'm going to meet him. I really want to meet him. And then sure enough, through, through Grenade, you know, we end up in the Virgin Fast Track 100. Not just once, but six times. I end up being a, a mentor for Virgin Startup, working with Virgin Unite, going on holiday with Richard to his game reserve in South Africa, not once, but twice. Going out, being invited to Necker Island, been invited to Necker Island again this year. I can't go, unfortunately. But again, been invited to the game reserve again this year. And it's all through just charitable projects and business and entrepreneurship. And it's just an amazing network. And if someone had said to me that, you know, that, that kid years ago was kind of skinny and nerdy mm. and liked training and didn't like being told what to do, would, would end up kind of being in that network. Yeah. You know, I'd have said, no chance. Yeah. And you know, your point about loss, I'm very lucky. I've never lost anyone that's really close to me. So my parents are both still here, uh, both in good health. My sister's still here. That's it. We're a really tiny family. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've lost, you know, close mm -hmm. friends and, and stuff. And again, my nan, a granddad and uncle kind of dying, but you know, they, they died through old age. There mm -hmm. was kind of no- Loved their life. Yeah, and I think the things, the, the, I think what resonates there, it wasn't the fact, again, they died because everyone dies. Again, it was the fact that they kind of, there's really no evidence to show that they ever existed. Um, certainly in the sense of my uncle, as I said, never left home. And actually where I said my dad didn't have much to show for it, he did, he had two kids, so we've gone on and done other things. Amazing, so I'm not, th amazing things. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I mean, my sister's trekked Antarctica and all sorts, and I'm super proud of her, but... So it's not, it's not the fact that um, he didn't really achieve anything because mm. he did. But again, I learned a lot. And he taught me a lot without actually deliberately teaching me anything. Yeah. But I learned a lot through what he did and didn't but that's do. That's an definitely. amazing thing. And that's for anybody that's watching or listening that no matter your background, no matter what you went through, you can make a successful life. Everybody's yeah. got the same 24 hours from the billionaire to the homeless man. People yeah. can change. People can appreciate life. And I believe you've still got to show gratitude for the things that you have. Do you think... That's really it helped you over the years that the fact that you never really had much Definitely. from a younger age that you decided, okay, well, fuck this. I'm just going to push the fuck it button and just keep striving until I leave a legacy because you says, look, people overworked and they never really had anything behind, but they still provided for their family as well. Everybody's got different levels to their game. You've obviously just went, I'm taking over the world, basically. I'm changing the world, which you're you're doing with your brand, which is yeah. phenomenal. I take my hat off to you. I think massive respect. I says that before it comes in because it takes courage. A lot of people see the end results. They don't see the grind behind the actual what goes on to build this platform and build a, a business. So for you, when you started training, exercising, what was the moment the seed planted that you were going to make a protein bar? Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for the compliments. I really, I really appreciate that. And we do feel we're just hopefully just getting getting started. And I think you know your point on having nothing and having something. I do think that if you can, if you can be happy with nothing, and I was always happy with nothing, you've got a chance of being happy potentially with not everything because who's got everything, but certainly a lot more. I've always said it's the icing on the cake. We've always gone out to work hard and build a brand and build a business. And, and, and I wanted to build something iconic in the fitness industry because that's the industry I've been in since I was 14 years old. So 30 years this year, this has been my industry. And I think because I saw my family not make a dent in the industry they were in, I don't want to kind of come out of this industry and there was no evidence show I was ever in it. So hopefully Grenade becomes an iconic brand like Coca-Cola. So we there. Yeah, oh no, thank you. But I can always be the guy that, founded grenade the tricky thing is uh, we not having children mm -hmm. because my wife and i don't have kids so we want to continue to build the brand and i'd love to build a billion dollar brand because it's a nice figure and we started with 500 quid so 
I'd like to go, you know, from 500 quid to 35 million to 72 million, which we did, then the next number and the next number, and hopefully to just a billion dollars in retail sales in the next five years. Um, but then what then? And your point on, uh, you know, going back to your point on, say, depression, I, everyone has sort of low moments in their, in their life. Um, thank God I don't think I'm the type of person or I've never been how you describe, say, depressed, for instance. But if you do an amazing thing, and, and I remember, say, standing on Necker Island, and Richard was very gracious, he let us have his room on Necker Island. So I stood on Necker, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, God, this is like, not just Necker, this is like Richard's room on Necker. Um, well, then, and the next day you leave, it's a low point, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So you have to get, and I'm still getting better, hopefully, in learning about this, is celebrating all the steps, whether they're up the mountain mm-hmm. or down the mountain, but you can't just get focused on being at the top of the mountain. Because if you climb Everest, you're at the top for 10 minutes. Yeah. And after that, you, you've got to come back down again. So I think you just have, we have to get better, everyone, at just embracing all the steps of the journey. You're going to have highs, you're going to have lows, mm-hmm. and you just have to find everything with a, a smile on your face. And I have, I've not had money, and I've had money, and I know what I prefer, mm-hmm. but I can honestly say that happiness has got nothing yeah. to do with, you know, That's having, a scary having thing. money you or know, not. Alan, about success, when a lot of people work their whole life to achieve it, they get to the finishing line and have not really enjoyed the journey along the way. Yeah, to and there's no plan life. of what to do next. goes fast. The most valuable currency, I believe, is your time. Yeah. So for me, I can be lazy as well. I can lie in the house for two days, three days, and everybody thinks he's working hard. I do work hard, but I do have my rest period where when I go flat, I stay flat, and I need to push myself out that again to go, right, I need to kick up the ass. It's difficult. And like you say, that's probably standing in Branson's house, um, and you're thinking what the fuck am I doing here? And it's probably a high, but then the low comes down. So how do you balance that? What do you do? I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm the worst person in the world to ask this question because I've never found balance because I, like, I'm kind of all or nothing. I mean, I do like, I like shooting and military stuff and I like flying and I like training. Training is very much linked to what I do. Um, so where other people might go to the gym and train, it feels like kind of downtime. It doesn't for me. I'm always on the phone. I'm always thinking of product ideas, product names, copy, marketing ideas, that sort of stuff. So I, I can't ever switch off. We also film a lot of stuff at my house in the gym and whatever. So when I'm at home, I still kind of feel like I'm Working. at work. You know, it's like if you've got a business when you're not at work. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in 80 countries now as well. So there's not many places I can go to where I don't have a distributor to meet, a retailer I want to mm-hmm. go and see. Podcast to uh, yeah, do. Yeah, a podcast to do. Uh, um, so I'm just really fortunate that people, act, we've got a story that people like to hear and people want to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to enjoy that while it's relevant and while mm-hmm. we're current and while we're building a sexy brand now. Because in 10, 15, 20 years' time, maybe in one year's time, no one will give a shit about me yeah. or the brand or Grenade or... But that's a good way to think, Alan, because You've got to make the lasts. most of it. It yeah. doesn't... It doesn't nothing you, lasts and yeah. you've touched on it. Listen, you, for what you're doing, it's, it's amazing. And, I, and for even giving me the time, I appreciate it. But oh, my pleasure. No it's, problem. Um, this is a problem with life, man. I think too many people concentrate on the future too much or the past where it's trying to get in the present moment, enjoying it. Like I say, you're doing all these things because you don't know what's around the corner, but you clearly got your head screwed on. You know exactly where you're going. You ain't going to stop. And I can't see you ever stopping, if I'm honest. I'm trying to build up a plan as to what I'll be doing because the day will come when I'm no longer at Grenade, you know, whether it's a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, I don't know. I know I'm unemployable, so it's the last job I'll ever have, you know, the last Mm -hmm. proper job. Um, We're really lucky that we've got very supportive investors in Lion Capital, and Lyndon's a phenomenal entrepreneur in his own right, so he gets brands and he's really supportive what we want to do, and he he gets it, and he kind of lets us crack on with it. Um, You know, they are not long-term equity holders in brands, you know, so they're going to want to exit uh, at a point, you know, as will I, because again, what's the point of working here till I'm 70, building a billion dollar brand, dying and leaving it all to the government? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so what's the point? So, I can always leave you my details. Yeah, Alan. obviously, yeah. Well, like, that's the only reason I came in, because yeah, I'm desperately trying to find out. You can be like the son I, uh, I, yeah. I never wanted. You can yeah. adopt me all you want, I mean, Never had, not never wanted, yeah. Um, but so I, I've, I've, I'm trying to now think of putting things in my life and starting to um, set my life up in the future, you know, when I'm not 
in the business 70 80 hours a week because that's the one thing i've seen people struggle and fail at and i've seen people become billionaires as you have and then they sell their business and they pull hundreds and hundreds of millions out and then what then yeah they get whether depressed is the the right word Mm -hmm. you know i don't know people listening to this will think we're crackers because they'll go you cannot be depressed with a billion pounds you absolutely can yeah yeah um money can have just as many negative connotations on your mental state, probably more Mm -hmm. than uh, not having money. And I get the fact you don't worry about certain things, but you got a whole lot of other things to worry about as well. So, and again, anyone who's made money, the first thing to worry about is losing it, Mm -hmm. which is again, is entirely possible. And I know lots of people have made hundreds of millions and lost hundreds of millions. So um, yeah, you can't take anything for granted. But the one thing I've noticed with people that have built amazing business and brands and then sold them, and then they leave that massive empty void, They don't plan for what happens after they achieve that target they've always wanted, whether it's your 100,000 subscribers or a million subscribers Mm -hmm. or, you know, to to become a millionaire. They kind of, and it catches them off guard um, and they expect almost like a marching band, you know, and these goals are in your head. And when you hit that goal, it doesn't really matter to anyone other than you. Mm -hmm. And then you hit the goal and then what then? You know, there isn't someone who just starts spraying confetti everywhere. There isn't a marching mm-hmm. band. You then think, okay, I did that. Great. What now? And and that's been, I think, a common, I mean, I don't want to say the word failure, but definitely, you know, a common issue with people who have had that enormous success and then the big void after. Mm-hmm. And I know people who've had number one hit records and, you know, that was the pinnacle of their career and they did it. But then who just wants one number one record? Yeah. You want another one and another yeah. one? G- I know, yeah, I know people mm-hmm. have won gold at the Olympics. And actually, is, that, is it greedy? Is it ambition? Yeah. Is it, you know, mm-hmm. if you've won gold at yeah, the Olympics... Yeah, greedy for the success. Yeah, for, yeah. Because so everybody, yeah, everybody... You, 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 who just yeah. wants one gold medal? Because mm-hmm. then you want two and mm-hmm. you want three and you want four. So that there, there has to... And some people do do that. Most don't. And I think for me now, I want to really start to put things in my life that I enjoy, one of which is doing stuff with military and military charities. So, and through shooting and sniping and stuff like that, and we're lucky we work with some really good regiments um, and they've taken me under the wing and I can do stuff and help their charities and Mm -hmm. there's some discreet charities we work with. But I'm just starting to kind of put things in place and almost now start to put them to one side. So if a day suddenly comes and then, you know, grenade's there and then it's not, whether or not I've, I've made the billion dollar brand, mm-hmm. I can then move on to the next project of my life, mm-hmm. whether it's conservation or, uh, I mean, you know, I, I like flying. I, I, I was in a plane crash years ago. So um, after that, I decided it'd be a good idea to go and learn to fly. <laughs> um, so I wasn't yeah. flying when we crashed, my friend was. <laughs> um, but aviation is a good thing to get into because you'll never meet a pilot that knows it all. There's always another aircraft, another skill, another rating. Uh, you can always go and do something else. So I think for people like us who always want the next thing, brands are good to work on because a brand isn't finished. But if you aren't in that brand, well, let's work on my aviation piloting skills. You mm-hmm. know, So I've, I can fly a fixed wing. I then want to go and fly a turboprop. I then want to go and fly a jet. I then want to do a helicopter rating, then mm-hmm. a helicopter instrument rating. And I think we just have to set ourselves up with all these mm-hmm. things along the way and go and tick the boxes. Yeah. Because if a day comes and we've just got an empty piece of paper, I think that's when we go mm. we go mad. Everything's limitless. Your yeah. business limitless, whether it's a million, a billion, ten billion. This show, this this brand that we're trying to get out as well, with anything goes, everything is limitless. The only person that can fail is yourself. Yeah. And you talk about when you achieve a goal, you're expecting confetti, confetti and the marching band. We spoke earlier, Tyson Fury, prime example. Yeah. In his mind, he wanted to be world champion, millionaire, had all the fame. He beat Klitschko, won all the belts succeeded, had so much money, but hurt the lowest point in his life where he was suicidal. So you need to be careful that that end goal isn't just the fulfillment of your life and the only thing because life goes on. It does. Yeah, well, and that's exactly it. And you know the thing as well, I can't imagine anything worse than being famous. I've got mm. no desire to be famous whatsoever. It's an illusion. It is. Yeah, it's a mirage. I, I love people who know the brand mm-hmm. and people might know kind of the, the story, but I can walk down the street and no one knows who I am and no one cares, which is brilliant. So we can do something and help people, but in a kind of discreet way. People, again, that know me know I like talking a lot and do lots of podcasts, lots of media. But again, it's all around the brand. It's not about becoming famous because genuinely I can't imagine anything worse. If you're, say, Tyson Fury have mentioned, okay, you know, he's known as a celebrity and for his sporting skill. But then imagine then that there's a, 
there's a time period on that because when you're number one, people care. Mm -hmm. The minute you're not, no one cares. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that celebrity culture where they people have to know who you are. And the mm -hmm. minute people don't know who you are or don't care, yeah. I can imagine that is pretty mm -hmm. depressing. Yeah, imagine so, being that well known yeah, yeah. and then after so, that just no one caring. Yeah, but that's the problem with the celebrities and I always say it, when they get that attention, when that attention goes, their life feels inadequate, but they're still the same person. Yeah, It's yeah, only yeah. them who's give that energy to think nobody likes me anymore I'm, my career's not going anywhere but they're still the same person but because they've already triggered it in their mind they think okay I'm not good enough anymore why, and that's why I believe suicide's on the right people don't value themselves enough I believe no. everybody's got potential everybody can change the world everybody can make waves and do whatever the fuck they want but it's again it's that the, the mentality it's the same if somebody at school your father saying and Les Brown used to say a motivational speaker, people's opinion of you does not have to be your reality. So it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, it's what you think as yeah, an individual. Yeah. And it's, again, mate, it's anything is possible, your prime example that it can be done, man. So I'll be hanging on to your coattails, I'll be keeping an eye on you, I'll be figuring <laughs> out, man, because yeah. you show me your friends and I'll show you your futures, they'll yeah. see we talk about now. Yeah, right? that's, I put that quote up, which I actually stole from you, so you've just, you've just stole it from Dan Stolen it back again. <laughs> I yeah. stole it from Dan I don't Dan know who he stole it from. Yeah. Um, um, so, before we get into the business side of things, how did the plane crash, how did that come about? Oh, so what happened there was, so I was working at a gym at the time, and like I said, I'd never been in a plane. So I was probably about 18, 19 years old, I guess, and a friend of mine that was coming into the gym. And actually, this is one thing that's been brilliant about the gym industry and the fitness industry is you meet all sorts of different people. And there were people coming in who were just regular Joes and worked at factories and had normal jobs. And there were people coming in who were multimillionaires. And there were people coming in who were just criminals. And there were a lot of criminals, you know, coming into the gyms in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, especially those kind of spit and sawdust gyms. These weren't mm. the polished fitness clubs. These were like the, yeah. you know, you know the type of gyms. Yeah. yeah, there's like there's electrical cables dripping yeah, down. Yeah. And if you didn't mind getting, you know, if you were worried about getting electrocuted, you shouldn't be training yeah. there. You know, there was a set of scales by the front door. And mm -hmm. if you weren't a certain weight, you weren't coming in. Um, yeah, these were the real hardcore gyms. And a, a friend of mine was, uh, he, he just passed his private pilot's license. And um, he wanted to get his hours up so he could go and fly commercially. And I said, oh, I've never been in a plane. And uh, he said, well, you've never been in a small plane. I went, no, I've never been in a plane. And they said, I'll take you flying. And um, he said, look, you know, I want to get my hours up. It was 60 quid an hour back then to hire a Cessna. And he said, um, if you want to kind of, he said, I'll pay for the one seat. He said, if you want to kind of fill the other three seats, um, just pay 45 quid and I'll, I'll take you wherever you want to go. And it's like 45 quid an hour. So I decided at the time I'm going to take me, my sister, and my girlfriend at the time, we were going to fly down to Bodmin from Coventry to surprise her granddad for his 80th birthday. And it's this little grass strip. So we, we kind of fly down to Bodmin. It's a really windy day. And uh, we end up landing on this grass strip and surprising him. And all that was fine. It was, it was flying back. We're in aviation. They call it the Swiss cheese model. And in aviation, it's not like something just goes wrong and everyone dies. Lots of things have to go wrong, kind of in, in a succession. Uh, that continually catch you out before then you before you know it, you've got a big problem. It actually nearly happened to me Sunday, funnily enough. That's another story. Um, and yeah, on. yeah. What well, what happened? But you planned for that, so it was fine. But then what happened at this particular time was we were coming back, and again, I think you know John had been slightly tight on his weight and balance calculations. I'd probably lied about what I weighed. Um, and it was a bit heavier <laughs> than they said. Off. Yeah, I yeah. do that every day. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> <I know>. yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm twelve stone. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm twelve stone. Um, my pockets full of change. <laughs> And um, the wind changed, the weather changed, so the weather ended up being slightly worse than forecast. We ended up getting slightly delayed. We didn't get a clearance that we wanted to fly through some controlled airspace, so we went around it. You can see in all the little things start building up. There was an issue with the plane. It had a slight fuel leak that was tiny. Um, and he was cleared of any blame. And ironically, what happened then, we ended up being, we were over Aston Cantlow in Stratford, where ironically now I'd live. And... Um, we were flying over there. We were probably about two minutes away from Coventry in flying time. And we're at 3,000 feet or whatever we are. And all of a sudden, there's this like... <laughs> like that. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound good. And uh, John was good as gold. He didn't say a word to us. He kind of taps a few mm -hmm. dials and gauges. Yeah. And... Uh, before and then he just says mayday 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 <laughs> gave, the, gave the end he gave the aircraft didn't say a word to it which is the right thing to do get, uh, gave the uh, a mayday call said you know engine failure 3,000 feet we were going to look for somewhere to, to land and call for assistance then he turned around and said I don't know what the problem is look we're going to have to put it down somewhere 
And um, I was sat front right seat. He was front left. My sister and girlfriend were behind me. So I kind of put my arm back. I like, put my hand back to hold anyone's hand in front because I was shitting myself. <laughs> and um, and we, we kind of circled round and we ended up um, we ended up planting this plane in a, in a potato field that hadn't been ploughed. And we got so lucky in the sense the field he was going for, he missed, I found out later. And we had the worst bit was... We, what a, a shit pilot. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no, do you know what, you know what happened? If we had hit the field he was going for, mm-hmm. um, it, 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 it turned out there were kind of pylons across the field that he hadn't seen. Mm-hmm. We probably would have hit those. Ironically, then he ended up kind of overshooting because remember you've got no power to be fair, so mm-hmm. it's 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 not like you can kind of keep going. You, you you're coming down. I think it took us 45 seconds to come down, pretty much. So, um, it, and I didn't know he'd missed this field until his staff was like I was going for that one. <laughs> but we um, we got we got lucky mm-hmm. twice in the sense that we just went over this barbed wire um, fence, and I was convinced we were going to hit it. And just as we skimmed this fence, and how the wheels didn't catch it, I don't know. But I thought, it, I mean, it could have come straight from the mm-hmm. cockpit. We'd all would have, uh, we'd have all got a haircut. Put it that way. Um, <laughs> and, and just as we skimmed it, we got the stall warner went off, which I didn't know what the st- I know what stall warner is now. What is that? So, a st- so if you ever hear, a, we see a disaster program or anything with like military mm-hmm. helicopter crashing or anything in the cockpit, you get the beep 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 beep. Mm-hmm. beep. Next time you see a disaster, I'm listening for it because it's going yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, you hear that when it follows. I'm, I'm yeah. scared of flying as, as okay, I yeah, now, you'll, you'll be fucking I'm terrified. Fine. After this, yeah. So you should come flying with me because statistically, Fuck that, now, man. no, statistically, Too many fuels and stati- yeah, st- st- statistically, <laughs> you, I think you'd have to fly every day for like twenty thousand years to be in a plane crash, and I've been mm-hmm. in one, so the chance of me being yeah. there is like in the billions. Um, <laughs> so the store warner is telling the people think it's the engine stalling. It's not. The engine was kind of already conking out. It's when you stall the, the wings, you stall the lift. So basically, wings are designed to generate lift, and it's all designed to have airflow going over them and, and, and to lift the wing and generate flight. And the, the, it's the angle of attack is basically where the wing is meeting the air has dropped to the point that you are not generating lift. So you've, you've stalled the wing, and therefore, yeah, you're not flying, you're kind of, you are crashing at that point. And, and as a pilot, if you can get the stall warner to go off, just as you touch down, it's like Nirvana, because it's as slow as you can go, Mm-hmm. without dropping and yeah that went off just as we went over that um uh that that barbed wire fence and it's not a nice noise we we landed and um we got lucky in the sense it was the day before christmas eve the ground was frozen and it was a um an unplowed potato field so it was kind of like landing on tarmac because mm-hmm. it was a hard surface um for every year for 30 years this farmer had at that point by the day before christmas eve He'd ploughed that field. This year he didn't. And there was no reason why he didn't. He just hadn't done it. And he'd done it every day for 30 years. That would have been a ploughed field. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't have been as Mm -hmm. as soft a landing. Um, The irony then, we kind of grind to a halt. The aircraft stays upright. We're all okay. We jump out. John checks the fuel tanks. They are bone dry. Um, Every plane in the area, including the police helicopter, has heard this mayday call. They're all flying around. I'm waving. He said, like, don't wave. Don't yeah, so think there's someone hurt. He said, mm-hmm. just walk clearly, you know, to the nearest kind of was a farmhouse we could see. Walk towards this farmhouse and they'll see that all four people are okay and walking and, and you know, panic over. So we kind of walked towards this farmhouse and uh, so knocked the door. So can we use your phone, please? I went, yeah, why? So we've run out of fuel. Okay, and they can't see a car. And they're like, yeah, where are you parked? I'm like, we're over there. And they can see this plane in their field. <laughs> and the irony is this company is Heart of England Balloons and they are, they are a franchisee for Virgin Balloon Flights. Mm-hmm. Oh, way. So can you can you believe it? So what was your mindset then when you were crashing? Do you think did you think you were going to die, or did you feel safe? There but- wasn't really that time to think about it. Um, I mean, I, yeah, potentially. I mean, I was. Um, like yeah, like near death experience nice. it's, kind of thing. Yeah, I wouldn't go as far as kind of near death experience, but it that was just fucking inches away from hitting pylons and fences. Yeah, and so for me, that's near death. Well, do you know what? As well, people probably don't walk away from these things uh-huh. particularly. I mean. John was brilliant, and he was, at, he was at, just to clarify as well, he was kind of cleared of any blame, there was a fault with the aircraft, mm-hmm. which again, if lots of other things hadn't happened in that order, yeah. we would never have known. You know, if we'd have, if the wind then hadn't changed, we'd have just landed, and to be fair, the next person that went in it could have had the same issue. How old were you? Oh, it would have been late night, I'd probably been about 20, 
about 20-ish maybe, something about 20, 21. Yeah, because um, it's, it sounds crazy, but a lot of near-death experiences can propel people to shoot into the future for success. Well, you know what I wanted to do? The because, first thing I wanted to do was learn to fly. Yeah. Because I think one thing I do remember is that feeling of helplessness. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, control. If you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're an entrepreneur... You know, and and again, there's nothing more daunting than a just a, a cockpit display and mm. not know what anything means, and then the aircraft not flying anymore. How long did you, it take you to go back onto a plane? It was uh, so I wanted to. It didn't. I wanted to get back on the horse sort of straight away. It didn't put me off flying. In fact, it was the opposite because I sort of thought, you know, my stat on how safe aviation is. I thought actually, well, I've, I've kind of mm. got my plane crash so out of the way. So as well, you're adrenaline junkie. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like yeah. yeah. Because I've never been into drink or drugs or anything mm. like that, so I've kind of my highs business and I like roller coasters. So and natural highs, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of that's how I get mm-hmm. my crashing my planes, bus. fucking crashing planes, shooting yeah. people. Yeah, <laughs> but you know it's weird. But within with with a certain element of safety, like that, I'd rather do that and try and land a plane, mm-hmm. you know, stalling than do a bungee jump or something yeah. where I just think you've got a chance of just hurting yourself. Mm-hmm. At least, if, to be fair, if you crash a, crash a plane, it goes wrong, you're dead. Uh, I wouldn't want to do something where I was just really badly hurt. <laughs> Makes me feel a lot safer. Do you know what I mean? For my <laughs> yeah, next so holiday, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. It gets me when you fly commercially uh-huh. now, and they're uh-huh. um, they're like, oh yeah. So if we have to make a water landing, yeah. and they show the plane on the water, and it was like, if you hit water at four hundred miles an hour, yeah. you know, it's like in concrete. If you jump off at the water at 10, 15 feet, <laughs> yeah, it's know, fucking yeah, sore. Yeah, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's not. You're not going to worry about yeah, your stilettos, yeah, yeah, yeah. are you? And jumping off uh-huh. on the raft. Um, but no, so the one thing I wanted to do was to, was to go and learn to fly. Mm-hmm. And I was working at the gym at the time and I was on less than minimum wage and I couldn't afford to learn to fly. But when I then set up my first distribution business in 1999, um, when it got to like sort of 2001, 2002, and it just started to bear a bit of fruit, it was kind of, that was my guilty mm-hmm. pleasure. It's the first thing I did was actually just go and, and learn to fly. Yeah. And I went to Wellsbourne and said, like, you know, I, I, I want to learn. Mm-hmm. So, have you been in the plane before? I said, I have, funnily enough. Mm-hmm. I said, I, you know, and he was like, oh, that was you. Yeah. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, we often talk about you. And, um, <laughs> it's yeah. how not to fly a plane. how not to fly a plane. <laughs> and, I, and again, actually, I was pretty good at it. Uh-huh. And I, um, I learned to, to, to fly, did it in 12 months, did it. In, I, I've actually flew solo at five hours which is unheard of and at the time was a record with not having any flying experience mm-hmm. uh, have five hours of lessons and then just go off flying by yourself but I was kind of pretty fearless at that point because yeah. the worst thing that can happen I'd done you're thinking that the, yeah. the odds of crashing again is millions to one so yeah, it ain't going to happen again yeah um, and people sometimes have hundreds of hours of flying lessons just to mm-hmm. learn to turn because they feel that they're going to fall out the sky mm-hmm. so I was kind of pretty fearless with that and I just wanted to prove it to myself and like we said get back on the horse uh, passed my pilot's license in the summer uh, of 2001, just before the month before 9/11, actually, and, um, and then I kind of had a year of flying, but I'd, I'd done it then. I mm-hmm. proved it. You I'd, spend a lot of time alone, Alan? Uh, not now so much. Not really, because I'm at work a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I did as a kid. I was always kind of quite good with my own company. Yeah. Um, as a kid, it's good to think yourself, and it's good to be there. So through all that, what was the first business you started up there in 1999? So that was a distribution business uh-huh. called Fusion, well, okay. uh, which was... So is this when the journey started? From yeah, the PT did, uh, to the yeah, first so one? Yeah, I, so I was working, um, I, just to yeah, get the middle bit of the story, uh, when I was 14, 15, did that work experience, as I said, and I just loved it. And I was kind of obliged to do 15 days of work experience of just like Monday to Friday for three weeks. And I did every hour, every minute of every day they'd let me. I went in Saturdays and Sundays as well. It's, again, it's just it's just who I am. If I'm going to do it, I'll do it. You're all in. Yeah, and uh, I was in it. I was learning loads. And uh, I got access to a proper gym for the first time. And I think for me as well, the most important thing was I was doing something none of my friends were doing. It was kind of my thing. I've always wanted to be one of one, not one of many. And all my friends were playing rugby and cricket and football. And I just wasn't interested in that stuff. And I'm still not. I wanted, no one was weight training in the 80s, other than the likes of Dorian and, and yeah, whatever, who you is, know. Yeah, yeah. And the, the amazing thing about that was, you know, Dorian ended up being, you know, the, the, the best bodybuilder in the world for five or six years in a row. And he was, the UK had someone who was the best in the world at something and no one knew who he was. Mm-hmm. His neighbour didn't know what he did. He, Dorian told me that himself. Yeah. So it was kind of a bit of an elite club where um, it was a very cottage industry it was kind of special it was the very early days of fitness and i just i'd get information from anyone that would teach me something and i'm like 10 stone ringing wet you know always skinny didn't eat a lot didn't have much of an appetite and i wanted to be big and everyone called me big al for a joke 
So I was like, all right, you know, you know, if I'm going to be Big Al, I'll show you Big Al. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, sort of three or four years, four years, later, years later, I was Big Al, I was like 18 stone. Um, so, and I was hanging around with people I looked up to for the first time. I didn't look up to the teachers and that at school. I found it a bit boring. I kind of, um, I don't want to say lost respect from the sense I was disruptive, but I just, I found school boring. I never enjoyed it. And it was all very conventional and I'm just not, a conventional person and I just wanted to go and do something different and he knew that a lot of teachers were knew quite well didn't particularly enjoy it they didn't particularly like kids but you know they'd set their stall out so that was going to be their career for 30 40 years and they were going to probably do it not particularly enjoy it in lots of cases and that was going to be their life like my dad had worked in his business for 40 years not particularly enjoyed it that was just his life I'm not knocking teachers because my sister's a school teacher and she's bloody good at it and she works bloody hard at mm-hmm. it but and people have to do those jobs but it just it just wasn't me and I'm, I'm in this gym then and there's kind of entrepreneurs and there's criminals and um, my parents hated it. The school hated it. Um, there, was, there was this real concerted effort from my parents and the school to get me out of that gym environment because I'm 15 years old, academically quite bright and everything, all my grades started to slip at school because uh, I just didn't want to be there. I, I was going to the gym every night, just became obsessed with it both with the training and also just hanging around people who are like 24, 25. They've got money, cars, jobs. Um, you know, they were, they were nightclub bouncers and they were doing things. They were letting me into nightclubs for free. I was jumping in and out of nice cars. Um, and it was, it was kind of hard not to get sucked in by that. I was very fortunate. The guys that owned the gym were, uh, again, really great people if they weren't I could have easily got sucked in with a with a wrong crowd they were kind of quite protective of me do you think because you weren't getting attention off your dad that because you were getting attention in the gym they became like your brother's family yeah probably that's why you accepted that as your home yeah definitely Um, and again not like your dad you know dad wasn't out down the pub you know dad doesn't drink yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's he's out he's out Mm. working hard for not a lot of money and um, yeah I I sort of still tried to persevere going down that Mm -hmm. academic route Mm -hmm. Uh, not knowing what I wanted to do. And I, I, I got through my GCSEs and I did well with kind of minimal effort. I got all A's and B's. And I then went to do A-levels and I just I just hated yeah. it. And I, and I was doing okay until I met this girl and the teachers hated this girl and therefore they, they, they hated me. And I started bunking off that as well. And again, I'm still going to the gym. Um, and again, there's kind of a concerted effort to stop me going to the gym. And I'm one of those people that if, if enough people try and stop me doing something, I'll just go the other way. Yeah. Every single time I'll go the other way. Rebel. Uh, yeah. And it's not even about just being rebellious. I just, I, I think what I think. And if people say you can't do it, it can't be done. I just want to prove it can. Yeah. I was told by our first investors, do not do Carb Killer. Well, can you imagine not doing that? And now yeah. we've sold hundreds and hundreds of millions of bars. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not a question of being right all the time. I'm, I'm wrong plenty mm-hmm. of times. But if I really believe in something, I have to go and go and do it. And uh, yeah, there was this concerted effort to, to, to stop me going to the gym. And I, uh, and I just I had a particular episode with a, a teacher at this particular sixth form school. Uh, I told her to F off and I uh, I just walked out, got straight on the number 11 bus, went straight to the gym and I said, look, I've just walked out of college, you've got to give me a job. And um, they were like, y- y- our parents are going, to, you know, your parents are going to fucking kill us. You can't give you a job. I'm like, well, look, it's it's here or somewhere else. So I'd rather it was here. So... Um, was people I, telling you you weren't good enough and you couldn't do things in a certain way that... Do you think that gave you the initiative to go were, and prove they, everyone wrong that I'm going to show everyone... That can be the biggest, the best, and yeah, I'm not but getting... everyone's obsessed with me just being academic because I was quite clever, mm-hmm. and it just seems the obvious thing to do is do exams if you if you're good at them. And no one got this gym thing, and I just I've always I think the best thing I've ever done, looking back now thirty years later, is gravitated toward things I've liked. And I think if you take any successful entrepreneur or any businessman, and you'll meet lots. Ask them if they enjoy what they do or they've enjoyed what they do. Mm-hmm. And I think if, if they've always steered towards something they've enjoyed and they've been good at it and they've worked hard, you've got a good chance yeah, of they've built a good business. Because you're going to keep chipping away at it. Yeah. Um, Who's made a fortune at something they hate? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So so how did it all start then? How did it, how did you become one of the biggest entrepreneurs in the UK? How did you get your mm-hmm. protein bar in 80 different countries? How did you sell shares over 70 million? How were you on your last legs with it to turn it over so far, so quick to become one of the fastest growing businesses in the UK. How did it start? Right, so uh, I ended up getting this job in this at the, the gym in the, in the late 90s. 
And actually, I thought it was going to get real hard time with my dad, but he was actually glad I'd got a job. I hadn't just dropped out of college and was sitting at home. So I end up getting this job. And then again, just I'm working at the gym, 70 quid a week, working quite a few hours. And, you know, I can't really live on 70 pounds a week. It was less than two pounds an hour even back then. But that's all they could afford to pay me. And I was just grateful of being in an environment that I loved. And again, I said people I looked up to. And um, I... I started doing some personal training on the side to make a bit more money. And so that was kind of took up my weekends. And then I still couldn't really make enough money. So I started working on the door in Birmingham, which again was kind of a classic thing. I'm quite a big lad at that point, fairly handy. So that was kind of the obvious next step. And it was a, a gym full of doormen. Then I ended up having my own security business. So then all the doormen are working for me. And I end up basically working at the gym five days a week. At, doing personal training at the weekends and working in the door Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night and Sunday night. So I was, if I was awake, which wasn't a lot, I was working mm -hmm. and still living at home, saving, saving, saving. And I used that money to basically put a deposit on my first house and to set up in 1999, my, my first business, which was a distribution business. Cause at the time then I'm not a big eater, like I'd said, and supplements were just starting to become more popular. And the, the gym I worked at, Lakeside Fitness Centre in Kings Norton, the uh, unit next door got taken over by a company called Biocare. They're, they're still there now. And um, the guy that owned Biocare, I'm still great friends with. I spoke to him last night, actually. And he kind of took me under his wing with supplements. And again, he taught me a lot. So, and he was always nice to me. And actually, to be fair, everyone was always nice to me, even though there really there was no reason to be nice to me. But you're a nice guy. Like you I was nice to everyone that. else. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And, and I think I, I, what I've now learned looking back on that time was I learned how to deal with people. I learned personality takes you a long way. Obviously, hard work and all this stuff is is kind of a given. But if you've got the personality, you do what you say you'll do when you say you'll do it. People do things for you that they wouldn't necessarily have to do. You know, John from Biocare didn't have to give me the time of day. He was making a lot of money. He sold his business for tens of millions. And, uh, you know, he made the first supplements for me that I then went on to sell, which I didn't make a lot of because, again, I was learning in business. But that distribution business um, then I, I had from 1999 to, to 2008. I met my current wife in 2003, and she came into that business in 2005. And it was very much a lifestyle business. It was only the two of us. But we learned so much and, and, and we were good at it. So I was then going around gyms, selling them supplements. So, um, you know, rather than just working in a gym, I just had this business where I'd get the best supplements each brand had got. I'd cherry pick all the best stuff and I knew what to have because I, I was a user myself. So I would, uh, and I'd take these gyms. Nobody wanted supplements back then. I mean, I supplied Dorian and Temple mm -hmm. and all sorts, but nobody wanted to buy supplements because it was a, it was a risk. Um, so I'd say, look, just let, you know, let me supply your gym, only deal with me. I will give you anything you want. I'll give you all the best selling stuff and I'll put it on your shelves free of charge. I'll come back next week. If you've sold anything, pay me and I'll replace it. If, if you haven't, then you don't owe me anything. And everyone said, you'll never make that work. You know, yes, but you won't make it. You won't come back. And I did. And I remember I'd go back to every gym week after week after gym, after week. And some weeks, yeah, they hadn't sold anything. And I'd put stuff in the back of my car and I'd take it round. And I'd drive, I'd drive miles to sell a box of flapjacks and make a fiver. Um, so, but I just persevered at it. And again, going to the gyms, just day and night, day and night, still working at the gym in the day, doing the supplement deliveries at night until I could kind of build up a bit of a, a round. And, and I kind of had the, the, the Midlands as my area, so all around Birmingham, Coventry, out as far as Leicester, and, and gyms then in the, in the mid, late 90s, uh, early noughties are kind of popping up all over the place. Fitness is starting to take off. Supplements now are starting to become more popular. Um, they're kind of a genuine alternative to food. They're getting better. The branding's getting sexier. And um, oh. yeah, you know, my wife and I built, built this business, just the two of us, and again, we worked ridiculously hard just the two of us you know she's offloading lorries before lifts i'm out day and night selling supplements um you know just seven days a week um to the point that we just kind of got burnt out with it and i was a middleman i was the distributor so i was always stuck between the gym buying the supplements or the retailer and you know generally the american brand who were supplying them and it wasn't long before they were going to start kind of talking to each other when i'd kind of built the business and every year it was getting that bit harder margins getting squeezed i was having to do more the sale or return wasn't 
really you know enough because I managed to build a business where um, the margin was 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 pretty good because the service was so good I could pretty much charge anything really because the gym wasn't paying unless they sold it so there was no risk then it was getting to the stage that you know anyone would do it for free and a lot of the brands were starting to shit on me so you know they were giving the gyms my prices just to go even though they had nothing to gain this and actually brands subsequently they did that ultimately all ended up failing but um really bizarre I, again I learned a lot about business like I said where you know brands then were sort of shitting on the distributors the internet was becoming quite prevalent consumers now weren't buying from the gym they're buying online everyone's selling stuff cheaply online I could just see my business ero yeah, eroding we're working oh. harder than ever and just I could just see those 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 margins dropping um and and I said to said to my wife you know we we need our own brand we need to have something here that kind of we build that, that that's us and one of the most important things i'd learned was from distributing other people's ranges who had in many cases hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of products 95 percent of which didn't sell and i thought actually coke do quite well with one product red bull do quite well with one product so i thought we just need one product here and i thought okay if it's one product what would it be and at some point, everyone in their life wants to lose weight. And I'd spent years working with athletes and bodybuilders and knew all sorts about supplements and weight loss. I got access to John from Biocare, as you know, a phenomenal um, uh, biochemist. And I thought, okay, if I put together like a, a weight loss product, we could probably, that would probably be enough. That's all we'd need. Let other people have all the protein powders and, and all that stuff, the drinks, all the stuff that's kind of a ball lake. It's bulky and low margin. Let someone else have it. Um, and I wanted something that you could take and you knew you'd have it, you knew you'd had it. A protein powder, it either tastes nice or it doesn't, but how can you tell when it's working, how it's working, if mm. it's any good? You can't really be on the taste. So I wanted something where you could go, wow, that's good. And you could actually, it did what it said on the tin. Um, so I developed this weight loss product in 2006 and just sat on it in generic white capsules, not really knowing what to do with it. And we still carry on with fusion and we're working hard. And uh, I ended up, I, I gave some capsules to a friend of mine who was doing some training at the time for, um, for special forces because I've got lots of friends in the military. And I said, do me a favor, so just try these, let me know what you think. And I was out running one Sunday morning and he rang me and uh, he said, I'll try those capsules. He said, it was like, I felt like I'd swallowed a grenade. And I thought, God, that's a bloody good name. Is that the light bulb moment? Yeah. So I go, I go back home and I said, I've got the name. I'm going to call it the name. <laughs> Still and, and you know, the, you know, the best part of the story as well is <clears throat> everyone else, apart from my wife, said, "What a stupid name! What a shit name!" Yeah, blah, fucking blah. women are crazy. Man. Yeah, and she's like, it. "Yeah, I love it." Mm -hmm. And and we've we're kind of lucky in the sense we kind of get it because if you if you get one person to back your idea, you're off. So if she'd have said it's shit, I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. um, so you think, okay, we've got the name. That's great. So. We protect the name in Europe. And we think, actually, I wonder if we could do more than the name or we could actually the bottle. Because you think the name was so good for that type of product. I think it's a great yeah. name as well. But I think yeah, if we yeah. put it on the side of a, just a generic white bottle, it's just a waste. And all the fat burners at the time were things like, you know, Xenadrine, Zedrica. Yeah, legal ones I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but yes, T5. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, I've got some in the cupboard somewhere. I'll, I'll give you some. They're probably about 15 years old. You, you, you'd yeah. probably rather take your chances with the coronavirus. Um, we'll, do, we'll have a T5 afterwards. Here. You'll see if they're any good. I can't get anyone to take them. I'm not taking that I'll shit. Take yeah, you'll, 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 you'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, you'll, yeah, you'll, be, uh, you'll be smoking a crack pipe by the weekend. <laughs> Um, on a plane so, yeah on a, pl <laughs> on a plane in, in, a, in a field uh -huh. um, so um, I thought I wonder if we could get a, a bottle in a grenade shape so I kind of do a bit quick googling can't find anything don't really know what to do end up speaking to my dad fuck knows why because he doesn't know anyone um, and he doesn't and, I, and I, it's just it's the best conversation I've ever had with my dad I said dad where would I get a grenade shaped bottle from and I just by sheer chance again and I'm a big believer in fate the business opposite his, when he has his heavy goods vehicle his business, he's only like a bloody a plastic injection tool maker and tool molder. So he said, oh, you want to give, you want to give him a ring? So I go to the yellow pages, look it up, and I ring him up. I said, oh, do you remember me? I'm Graham Barrett's son. He went, oh, yeah, yeah, I do, actually. I said, oh, his business, he went, shit, which is about to close the doors. I said, oh, was it bad? He went, yeah, all tool making's gone to India and China, and, um, you know, we haven't taken a salary for two years. It's just me and Dave. Now we've had to let everyone go, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, can I come and 
talk to you. I want to see if you can make me a grenade shape bottle. And we did. He drew it up. He did it. I mean, we still work with him today. Just That's a legend. unbelievable. Legend. Huh? Yeah. Now he employs about 10 people and um, he has a holiday every year and he's actually got, we're, we're his only customer. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just a big believer. I'm going to work with people that you know and like and, and using, Thank you know, work close to you. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, we end up uh, making this and, you know, we go to trading standards and say, we you have a problem with us, with a, this, you know, with this grenade product. You know, what do you think? And um, they were like, well, it's no different from a child's toy, really. And one thing they suggested was if you get like a, a replica plastic Good gun, yeah. a lot of the time it's got bright orange parts mm -hmm. on, so it doesn't get confused yeah, yeah, for the yeah. real thing. So that's why on a, great, a green grenade bottle, we've got the orange logo. That's where the orange comes from. So it's to, to reduce the, ch the likelihood of someone actually thinking it's a real one. And mm. that's why we actually ended up with green and orange. Yeah, so you were getting yeah. all these kind of answers and things put in front of you just by going to speak to your dad, going yeah. to speak to the health and safety and they're getting, and you're thinking of new ideas, but that's again the entrepreneurial ships. You're thinking as you go along, when you've seen your business crumbling, you didn't give up. You decided yeah. what's the new income, what's the new thing, the internet, and you've jumped on that. What's the key to your success, Alan? Um, I mean, there's, there's no such one thing, but I think you've got to have, I mean, there's, there's probably 20 answers I could give. There's all the obvious stuff that if you wrote a list, you need to have, you need to have a world-class product brand or service you need to have an amazing vision or people around you it's just one person that that gets it you've got to have the ability to recruit a team you know as soon as you can afford to to take things off your plate and help you grow hard work's obviously a, a given you've got to take tremendous amounts of risk you have to get really good at, at, at being fearless not being scared to fail um fail is your friend you know people are terrified of failing Failure is great if yeah. it's quick. It's uh, the longer, the more drawn out it is, the more painful it is. It's like death by a thousand cuts, I always say. If you can fail quickly, fine, you know, manage the downside, learn from it, re, you know, bounce back. Our first bars, we tried 40, 50 different bars um, and just, you know, kept getting rejected. We couldn't get it right. We just kept improving, kept improving it. Just that tenacity, perseverance, having passion. Um, personality we're dealing with people treat people like you'd want yeah. you know treat them like you'd want to be treated yourself and i think scour your network i was i was probably fortunate in the sense that through working in the gyms and if you think let's say you know in that one gym my first gym i worked at let's say there were 300 people i'm just i'm just guessing imagine how many people then they would know and i knew everyone's first name um and i knew a lot of their extended friends that they'd bring in as well that's one gym i supplied at the peak, probably 50, 60 gyms. I knew I still bump into people today and they're like, oh, you used to deliver to that gym 15 years ago from the nightclubs. Thousands of people coming through nightclubs. I'm good with names, good with faces. I've got good mm. memory. And that's one thing I had at school was a good memory. That's kind of why I was clever because I could regurgitate stuff mm. that told me and it just means you're clever if you can remember things. Yeah, that's all. That's memorization. Yeah, I don't really yeah. get it, but it's... Um, so if you think, you know, if I knew... A thousand people how many people do they know and all the answers are there you'll know someone who knows someone you just have to put in the you have to have the hustle mm -hmm. and i think from the age of like 11 or so you know i kind of had the, the hustle mm -hmm. i was always going to be kind of that sort of like you mm -hmm. said you were the, the the class clown i was going to kind of be the cheeky guy that would get you to do mm -hmm. something you shouldn't do if you came to my door and sold me something i'd probably buy it yeah and i've spoke to a lot of billionaires and entrepreneurs they're ruthless, Alan, but you're quite I'm definitely a humble, not ruthless. You're quite a humble yeah. guy, nice guy. And it goes to show you don't need to be that cutthroat person to have a successful business. And you know what? That's something, again, I learned from someone because my first... Because, yeah, yeah, I thought then, because you just think, oh, yeah, you've got to be absolutely ruthless in business. Mm. And, yeah, I want to make money. I want to make money with a conscience the right way. And I learned that from my first ever personal training client. It was a guy called Stuart Sap Sapcut who had a, a massive building business in Birmingham, still does. And, you know, I don't have a car and I'm personal track and he's got like four Ferraris at the time. And everyone was jealous of him. I was never jealous of him because again, he worked fucking hard and was a really mm -hmm. nice guy. Yeah. And again, he was really nice to me and he didn't have to be. And I was good with him. But, you know, I remember, and again, I, I not only learned stuff he told me, I learned how you can have money because he had money and I didn't. I learned how that could be a problem because I saw how people treated him. So I, so I learned from that. And I think if you just keep on 
learning. All mm. these scenarios are out there, but people are just blind. They're blind to what's going on yeah. around them. They, they don't, they're not taking mm -hmm. this stuff in. And I'm just interested in people and my environment. You're clearly and interested in learning. You're like a sponge, Alan. I've noticed when you're talking about things, are people, you're attracted to them because you think, right, success leaves clues. It leaves clues. So if you're thinking, right, they're successful, he's got this, I want to learn from him. He's clearly yeah. got the answers that I don't. Everybody knows something that you don't. You've clearly adapted to that and learned that I can learn from him, learn from him, and then you've put it all in one. How do you deal with hatred, negativity? Because it comes, no matter how nice a man you are, the how, the, see when you started becoming really successful, did you receive any jealousy, hatred? People try to... Not particularly, no. And hopefully you kind of, I'm a big believer that you do, you, you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. So not really. If you do get, I get little tiny dribbles of it online, but I mean, it's tiny. Mm -hmm. And it's people that don't know me. So just, you know, you ignore the small voice. I've got no problem at all about that. I'm very happy with who I am, you know, how we conduct business. I, I am far from perfect. But certainly, you know, we've never lost anyone we wanted to keep. Again, if you handle a situation badly, you learn how to handle it better the next mm -hmm. time. Um, I, you know, I mean, like I said, when, when I was looking back at the likes of Stuart, I'll give you an example, for instance, of how people treated him. Um, when, when it was my 21st birthday, for instance, he gave me £210 for my 21st birthday. I was on £70 a week. You know, that was like... That was, a, that was the most money I'd ever had. And I just, I refused to accept it to the point that because I didn't want that to pollute the relationship. And it, frankly, everybody wanted money from him. So I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't mm. want to be, you know, he was paying me to train him. I was getting a 10 quid an hour to train him. That was, that was the deal. And I know he'd said in the past, she would fall out with people over family and friends and, and money because it's kind of the root of all evil. So I, I liked him so much and respected him. And he was teaching me things. I didn't want money to ruin that. So I refused to take the money. And then he ended up, um, he bought me a car alarm, which was 200 pounds, which I, I, uh, I was, he knew I was going to go and do. So he kind of bypassed me and did something anyway. So I, I got it. I mentioned it to one person in the gym that Stuart had given me 200 pounds for my birthday. And, and they, and do you know what they said? You could probably work it out. Mm. They, bet, they said how cheap he was, how tight he was. Yeah. They didn't see the goodness yeah. of it. And I was like, and I was, what? What? Yeah. Uh, and he, they said, oh, well, he's a multimillionaire. Yeah. He only gave it 200. Mm -hmm. I said, what was he supposed to give me? Yeah, a yeah, fucking yeah. Ferrari. I mean, I, <laughs> and I just thought, Jesus, is that people's mentality? Yeah. Uh, I think I probably told him that. I'm still mm. friends with him to this day. But that's the people who don't succeed, Alan. That is the people yeah. who hate on other people. Well, they're people jealous. I've never you, been. The way they take inspiration are people be jealous. People watch my stuff and go, he's full of shit. Or people who watch my stuff and go, he's changed. Look what he's doing. Look at the people he's surrounded by. With. People will take inspiration. And that's the people who will succeed if they believe in themselves enough and keep striving and keep chipping away inch by inch to be better, to keep grown a business and, and keep doing what you're doing it can be done well do you know what? I had my 40th birthday three years ago oh bastard and, and we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like feelings you know um, and uh, I and my wife did like a surprise party for me and we probably invited about 150 people and, and they all came and a lot of them and again these were people who've been friends for 20 years I've never, again, I've never lost a friend I wanted to keep mm -hmm. and I'd got it, everyone in our and most people didn't know each other and there were friends from old and, and, and friends of new and everyone I spoke to said the same thing the next day what a nice bunch of people mm -hmm. everyone said that and it was like we had you know Stuart came by helicopter uh, you know and he came for like an hour and then went back again but you know he, he came because he really wanted to come and, 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 and see it and then I had my friends from the chapel gym when I was on work experience mm -hmm. and like they're, they're dustbin men you know, they came and they're all talking and everyone had a good time. And it was just, and everyone said, oh God, you know, you've not, you've not changed. Mm. But I was, I've always been, I've always been happy and the people, I'm, I'm okay, I've got lots of new people around me now, but I've really tried to keep the older people around me as well. So you do kind of remember, you know, where, where you come yeah. from. And anything that's different yeah. is I've just got some different options now. I think I'm, that, I'm um, super yeah. pressed for time, but. I think that um, shows you your character, brother, because no matter if it's a bin man, a nurse, Richard Branson, <laughs> It's, um, but, but it you shows know what? you you who you are as I, a, a decent guy. I like guy. being around nice people. Thanks, and I mean, mate, and, 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 and at the time, I felt like, well, <laughs> yeah, present company accepted. But I, so, so, so I give an example, and I won't, and I won't say who, who, it, who it is. But I was training back in the day, back in the late nineties, mm -hmm. with someone who's again is still a great friend of mine, and he turned his life around, and he was robbing petrol stations, and I was training with him, and I knew what was going on, and everyone knew what was going on, and he was on Crime Watch, 
and he was kind of caught banged to, bang to rights. And, you know, the following day on Crime Watch, everyone was saying, was that so-and-so? And I was like, no, no, <laughs> no. And it, even, even my mum mm-hmm. saw him on, because he'd been mm-hmm. around my house, mm-hmm. this car he'd used was parked outside my parents' house, mm-hmm. and my parents are, like, super straight. Mm-hmm. And mum mom was like, is that so-and-so? And I was like, no, no. He was really, it was, it was very yeah. distinctive. Mm-hmm. And um, mum was like, no, no, it definitely is. Definitely is him. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not, mum. And, and they were like, they're saying, oh yeah, the beliefs have got away and have stolen uh-huh. Nissan Micra, uh-huh. silver. And it wasn't. It was a, it was a silver Vauxhall mm-hmm. Corsa GSI that's parked mm-hmm. on my fucking drive. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. And, um, and, and even, and this, this goes to show you how you can get away with stuff when people like you. Mm-hmm. Everyone liked him. Even my mom said, oh, he's a lovely man. Oh, he's a lovely man. He's a lovely... And they, they still ask. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of takes you... So even when you kind of lose your way, mm-hmm. it, it, it does, take you, it does yeah. take you a long way. And with regard to, you know, common and negative people, I, I, I do try and avoid them. And yeah. I do think it's kind of toxic. But you've got a good energy and you, you've got a good presence where you know exactly what you want. You surround yourself with the right people. Yeah. You control your life. You don't let anybody interfere and you clearly don't let anybody tell you what to do, you, which is a great thing. You know, the problem I get as well, I've kind of, and this is going to, you'll probably get this with like the Iowasa stuff and, and whatever, but... I, I'm kind of now getting more interested in, in energy and, and everyone said about, oh, you've got this great energy and, and again, it's a fantastic compliment. Mm-hmm. And certainly where I've spent a lot of time, say, around the likes of Richard Branson, he's got this amazing energy, which is brilliant. The problem is people drain it. Yeah. Energy vampires. Yeah, yeah. yeah it does. And they don't mean to do it, mm-hmm. but I'm now getting more conscious of being around people that do drain y- your energy and I, I do try and Get them, out, get them out of my life. You do just get some people who are just kind of would argue with their own shadow. And mm. again, I, I don't think I've got jealous people around me because people know I, I, yeah. I work hard. But, you know, I did a podcast yesterday and mm. we came to the same conclusion in the sense that readers, there's three ways you can make money. You know, you can, well, four if you steal it, but I suppose steal it, but <laughs> other, other than stealing it, um, you know, basically you can you can inherit it, win it or earn it. Mm. And I think if you've earned it, that's the, mm. that's the way you want to yeah. you want to do it because you don't learn anything if yeah. you win it. You don't learn anything if you inherit mm. it. People hate that. People get them more jealous. They want you got it for, for no work, so mm. they want it for no yeah. work. And I think that's quite yeah. toxic. I think I probably already know the answer to this, but see when you you try to distribute it to maybe 40, 50 different people, was there a time you ever thought, I'm going to quit, it's not for me? Oh God, most weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you're not getting those thoughts, um, that's, yeah, that's probably perfectly normal. Mm. And again, just to kind of finish the question you asked about half an hour ago, sorry, I'm rambling. Just to finish that in terms of we, we launched that, that fat burner product, you know, you said, how do we get to, how do mm. we build this protein bar business? Um, you know, we launch our fat burner and for two years, we just focus on that, that one thing. I think, you know, if you want to do something in business, you've got to own it you know, just have one product, make it work, focus, that singularity of purpose. And for four years, Jules and I did not have a day off. We did not take a salary. We had a massive row with my accountant when he said, oh, I've allocated you 500 pounds a month for tax reasons. And we're like, Don't, we're not taking it. We're not taking the money. We became obsessed with taking no money at the business. And if someone had said, right, you know, dig a hole in the ground, it's going to take you all day. There's a tenner. Jules and I be there with shovels. Mm-hmm. You know, we were like, we'd absolutely own it. We had a very real conversation about us going and living in a one bedroom flat, specific, or, or a bed oh. specifically on Allen Rock, because we thought we'd lost the house. We're down to 27 quid. And then, you know, the fat burner's kind of doing okay, but it was, you know, but we kind of had that story. We thought, do you know what? No one's died. Mm-hmm. We just we do it all over again. You don't kind of yeah. wallow in in self. So you see the goodness and everything. Yeah, we, I'd like to think I'd mostly try and yeah. be, you know, glass yeah. glass half full. I've got a friend of mine too lend us a, a tank because he owns lots of tanks and he, he lent us a tank to take into body power at this big show at the NEC and we kind of stole the show and again once again people doing things for you just because mm-hmm. they like you or, or they're interested or you you're excited so it makes them excited and over the years we chipped away after four years uh, growth point capital kind of popped up and they're like you know long story cut short your business is worth 35 million you know we'd like to mm-hmm. we'd like to invest in the business We'd like to invest the majority, but we want you guys to stay and carry on running it. So, well, okay, we've got a chance here of taking some money off the table, but, you know, we're not done. We don't want to sell. Mm-hmm. So they're like, look, just hit the reset button and go again. But this is risky, so, you know, you could lose everything. And I had friends that had lost everything. So like, okay, so broadly we sell half the shares. We hit the reset button. We carry on. That night, we literally, people said, how would you celebrate? We had a curry and I had a Cadbury's cream egg. Because <laughs> um, I don't drink or anything. So, and it was like, 
But it was that point of, you know, there's no mm-hmm. marching band. Mm-hmm. We're like, okay, great, tick the box. Now then we're, you know, at that point, okay, we're multimillionaires, yeah. but that's not what it's about. It was never about making money. Keeping yourself grounded. Yeah, so we hit the reset button, we go again. We, what do you I've, mean go again? So, yeah, so, so, basically when, you then, sold, so when you sold your shares... So we sold broadly 60% of right. the business at the time. And then... But, what was the deal with them then? How did you... Well, basically, private equity aren't going to come in and run your business. You mm-hmm. know, they, they need you to run your business, but they are taking a calculated gamble that you will build a bigger business that they will own a good share of. So that's... That's exactly you know what they did, but they needed us there, kind of running the business and giving you some structure. Becomes a bit more formalised, board meetings and all the stuff that I just absolutely fundamentally hate. Mm-hmm. Um, but back then, you know, they're kind of really backing the sports nutrition industry. But the sports nutrition industry then had kind of peaked. So had we never launched that bar, that was an amazing deal because the business didn't really grow much beyond that point with the current products that we had. But I had this idea of taking everything we'd learned. And just actually, I'm really big on making things simple because if you can make things simple to the point I can understand them, hopefully anyone can understand them. And we, we've been making very technically complicate, complicated stuff like fat burners, pre-workouts, expensive stuff, available in specialised locations like GNC, Holland and Barrett, Tesco Nutricenter. Um, and all the places that we could be, we were. So like, okay, well, where do we go now? We're in all the Tesco's, we're in all the Holland and Barrett's. You can't keep on launching more products in those locations and i remembered back in the day and i made the comment about red bull we thought if we want to be the red bull of sports nutrition we have to have a product that's sold next to red bull you don't go into a petrol station and see a 50 pound fat burner sat next to a two quid can of red bull so that, okay if we can people loved our stuff but a lot of the time they couldn't afford it there weren't enough of them we were supplying the military but there's not that many of them so if we can kind of, and we know people want high protein and sugar becoming the enemy, and there's the protein bar industry, which is pretty horrific because nobody makes a good protein bar. This is five years ago. They all taste like, you know, a dog toy. Sure. Um, and there's very much this, well, protein bar is supposed to taste like that because they're good for you, so they should taste shit. It was like, well, why should they? It's back to that. If everyone says it can't be done and it's yeah. taste shit, I'm going to go and prove different. You know, prove them different. So spend two years working on, a protein bar, chocolate covered protein bar that was low carb, that tasted good and there just wasn't one. And we spent two years and everyone was kind of getting pretty pissed off with me keep on presenting protein bars that were just very, very, very slowly getting better, but only marginally. Um, And then we get the bar that I'm pretty happy with. I'm like 90% happy with and I think that's the one. And uh, I sort of show out, and I was doing this in secret because our investors at the time were dead against it. So I've kind of just done it in the background. They wanted to stay the same product, the yeah, same Yeah, they wanted to carry on with proteins and, and weight loss yeah. and, and pre-workouts, which we were going to continue because that's important. You know, that's important, like having a Land Rover Defender is important if you're Land Rover, but they want to go and sell Range Rovers. So you need the authenticity and the credibility at being good in that specialised market, in our case, high-performance nutrition and selling to the military and Olympic athletes, but you then have to take that credibility and then use it somewhere else. So, you know, Ferrari get credibility by winning races on the track, makes people want to buy cars. You know, if they have a shit season, I guarantee you they sell less cars. Mm -hmm. So the the two are linked. So I decide uh, this protein bar is the way forward. And then all of a sudden, we, we, we don't just have you know, 60 GNC stores in the UK, we've now got 10,000 petrol stations. Grove Point owned 1% of a petrol station chain called Rontech. So we went with Grove Point to get these, help us get these bars into this petrol station, which took a long time. And eventually I got a meeting with Gerald Ronson, who's kind of some crazy billionaire, and he just kind of liked me. And he said, if you'd have come to me three weeks ago, I'd have said no. He said, we were just in a meeting saying the fact we need to sell kind of less Red Bull and less pasties, even though we sell a lot of Red Bull and a lot of mm-hmm. pasties. And he said, I'll give you a shot. He said, I'll give you one petrol station. So we've got protein bars and one petrol station. <laughs> and uh, I drive down to the petrol station. It's like it's on the You've A14. You've done start buying it yourself, yeah. did you? Oh, I've done all that. Oh, God, yeah, I've done all that. I bought, <laughs> I bought more of my own stuff than anyone else. It's not a sustainable business model, so I wouldn't recommend it, but I can promise I have done mm-hmm. it. There just comes a point you think, fuck it, I'll buy it then. <laughs> so, um, I, and I get to know that the the Sri Lankan <laughs> business, yeah, yeah, give, him, the king, g- oh, yeah. give him a t-shirt, yeah. explain about the product. Anyway, it did pretty well. And the one turns into 10, into 50. No big distributor would touch us. Why? So it, because it's still tiny. And again, if you think, if you want to get into, I'm talking about the likes of Booker, 
um, the big cash and cash carry and is the best way. Yeah, so because that's who mostly the petrol stations are buying from a huge buying group. They only want the Pepsis, Cokes. Yeah, Dairy Milk. Yeah, of, da- yeah, yeah. Cadbury's, yeah, proven FMG, FMCG stuff. Mm-hmm. The stuff, frankly, have been selling for the last 50, 100 years. You know, why wouldn't they? If you think a supermarket doesn't have elastic shelves, how much space has a petrol station got? Mm-hmm. Nothing. So um, anyway, I call, I said to rally the troops. I'm a, I'm a wartime general, so I rally the troops. I'm like, guys, we'd go, we're doing the hands-to-hand combat. Mm. We are going to make these products the best-selling products in those petrol stations. And frankly, they're all making sort of naffle margin on chocolate, but they're making good margin on our stuff, and it's selling, and it's mm-hmm. outselling chocolate. So if you could sell 10 Mars bars and make 15p a bar, yeah. or you could sell 20 protein bars and make a pound a bar, what would you rather do? Mm-hmm. So it kind of takes off, mm-hmm. and it, it kind of takes off to the point that the supply outstrips the demand, and all of a sudden we've got like a 10 million bar backlog on orders, which kind of starts to create even more demand. And just kind of being nerdy for a second, if you're in the petrol station market, it's incredibly stable, because people don't buy any more or less petrol. Mm-hmm. So peaks a bit in the summer because people go on holiday, but generally it kind of, it, mm-hmm. it, it carries on. Nick shitting himself that we're running out of camera time and he hasn't bought a spare no, battery with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we, but they showed us, Rontex showed us their petrol sales, which is sort of completely flat. What matters in a petrol station is what people buy as well as petrol, mm-hmm. which on average is about a fiver. People spend broadly five quid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could kind of, you know, you could work out what on. So we come along and we spike the, the, the secondary sale by about 18 quid. So we quadruple what people are spending in a petrol station. And it's the point, the data looks like this and it just goes up and then just carries mm-hmm. on. Because what happened was people didn't buy one bar, they bought the whole box because you can't get these things. Anywhere else. Yeah, and it yeah. starts kind of trending as in people are putting stuff in social media. Oh, that petrol station on the A14, they've got grenade mm-hmm. bars. Then there's 20 people trying to buy grenade bars. Well, well, they're there, they're all buying, they're not getting them because they're sold out, but mm-hmm. then they're all buying petrol. So uh, this, we kind of start to really use and nurture this day. I think we've actually got something quite powerful mm-hmm. here. And then, yeah, long story short now, it's probably one and a half million bars a week. And That's best amazing. Chocolate bar in the Can UK. I, I, as well, Alan, so when I get into a petrol station, I always try and keep away from the chocolate. It tends to be in the left mm. side. But your fucking bars are on the counter. Yeah. Why Just, is that? Is that, that through... That's a number of reasons Is that, that through... Contacts because if I go there, I'm not got a bit of chocolate. But what I'll do, I'll get a wee protein bar because yeah. that's not got any sugar in it. Yeah. But before you know it, I'm two bars deep, and then yeah. before you know it, <laughs> when, you say, when you say two bars deep, I hope you're eating them. <laughs> otherwise, it sounds a little bit wrong. Um, but so, whatever you do with them is fine. I don't so, care what you do with them, Jamie. Just, just, just as long as you're so buying them. That's why fine. is your bars on the counter? I think there's three ways. It's not something we pay for, and it isn't the relationships. It, it's kind of there's a number of reasons. One of it's actually there's some theatre with grenade. And one thing I didn't say about the story is when I was like 15, 16 years old, my, one of my jobs, it was a Saturday job working at Workout World in Birmingham. And working in a shop, it's really boring. And you want something with some theatre. And I think the thing with, with Grenade, because everyone's kind of heard of it now. Everyone's got a story about it. Everyone's got a friend that uses it. Everyone's got a friend that's lost weight on, on thermodetonator or the friend in the military that uses it. Or, they, or they've got a funny story where they took one on the plane and they, you know, the, the plane got grounded or whatever. So there's some theatre there. And it's just become a really trusted product. And I think people just thought it's having a moment in time. But I think it's more than that. If you're a petrol, it goes back to our first petrol station owner. You can sell more of those bars than chocolate bars and make more money. So why not put it in the best location? The irony is where we're in supermarkets like Tesco, we're generally, we're beating chocolate and we're at the back of the store and they're at the front of the store and people are going in, walking past all the stuff at the front of the store, taking our stuff in the back and walking back out again. And it's unheard of. So now we've got a whole project to take all of our stuff in the back of the store to the front and put it in sexy locations Mm -hmm. to the point that does that help business it must it's too early to say actually i mean it will do and it's a slow process Mm because to get something in something's got to come out so then it's a conversation with the retailers okay well what are you taking out to put us there so and a lot of the time retailers are slow and don't want to do it but they're slowly coming around to the idea now that we're here to stay they make more money and it's actually what consumers want they don't want 30 40 50 grams of of sugar Mm -hmm. they're happy to pay 
a bit more, have yeah. something that's much better for but them. Cleaner. Yes. Yeah. This is where big businesses come in. You look at Greg's as well. Business was dropping. They've done a brought genius in, job. Brought in the vegan stuff, genius. the vegetarian, and business is booming again. Genius. This is a, the classic of business for me. You anyway. know, one of the things that I got with Greg's as well, that again is utter genius, that I just appreciate those little mm -hmm. stories in business. The whole part of the whole model for Greg's is they make product that people can eat one handed while driving. Yeah. Which kind of makes sense because mm -hmm. their average guy is white van man. He's driving and they're yeah. late going. They're going somewhere and he's eating something with one hand. Oh, fat bastards, man. You need yeah. to get yourself on the grenade power buzz. But you, you notice that, that that's why they have stuff that you can kind of slide out yeah, of the, yeah, the, the yeah, bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't have something you I have to physically open. I actually that my finger so I don't have had any oh, bag. Yeah. Um, it's not the sexiest thing you've ever seen. You cut, <laughs> your, you cut yourself owning a pasty. How do you get a paper cut that, from, a, from a sausage roll? Oh, I can imagine, yeah, that's pretty traumatic. So yeah. you, you must go and get some counselling for that. <laughs> so when you're going through the business model, then when you're, you get the wheels in motion, it's going forward. Did you ever feel that, okay, I've done it? When no. you started getting into the big businesses, the, it'll never the be cash finished. and carries. No, How many flavours did you start off with? One? One. And then now we've got 13. And you've just and gave me a new, a yeah, new one? Yeah, that's the 13th. Um, and we phased we phased a couple out, but only just because retailers don't have the space mm -hmm. to put twenty bars on shelves. I know you wanted to concentrate on the one product, which is the bar, but you've got shakes in as well. Yeah, we have absolutely. Is and that widening the horizons? That the broad? Yeah, shakes fly. So mm -hmm. again, it, and this just is is me personally. You know, if I if it's uh, summertime and I've just finished training, I wouldn't personally eat a protein bar after I've trained. I just condition myself over the years to have a protein shake. So again, no one was really doing really great tasting protein shakes that were high protein, low sugar and lactose free. So we did one because again, we were told it couldn't be done. So we just went and did it. Uh, and the shakes do extremely well. The thing with the shakes is you, you can have them ambient, but you really want them out of the fridge. And again, fridge space is competitive. So we've kind of gone now from being that ankle biter brand to, you, you, to the fact you'll see us next to Red Bull, Coke. Um, we've got stores where our rate of sale is better than milk, mm -hmm. which flies. And How again, the retail's more money. Um, yeah, it's quite special. Yeah. I mean, it's... Do you walk by like, uh, in petrol station, pay for your petrol, and feel it saying to the guy, those I love are mine. It. Uh, yeah, I love it. Do you know, those I, I, I don't, unless I don't have any, and I have to buy one, uh -huh. and I have to pay full price for it, which really grieves me. Have you ever like, every them? week, yeah, yeah, of course, because I'm not very organised. So, and I, I, I said to the guys, actually, at some point, I know, of, I said, bars everywhere. but have I ever fucking got one in the car when I want one? <laughs> of course not. So, do we have to go and buy my own product, which is irritating? Of course I do. So, the funny thing is, actually, with that. I said to the guys, you know, I'm mean, rebranding. I said, we're putting my fucking face on it. Yeah. I said, because that way I can go in and go, look, it's me. Yeah, Can't yeah. have it for nothing because it's me. <laughs> and uh, I don't think they'll see the funny sign. Um, but uh, my mom does that. She goes into Holland and Barra, asks where the grenade bars are, mm -hmm. asks how they're selling, asks what they're like. They show her and they go, oh, yeah, we don't want any, but my son owns the company. Yeah, 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 they yeah. must yeah. fucking hate her, um, to be honest. But no, I still get a massive amount of pride mm -hmm. from the first time I saw my product in a GNC store to a Holland and Barrett to a Tesco and then on Amazon I still get now you know going in the petrol mm -hmm. stations and the convenience stores I mean things like the local post we're in the middle of nowhere you've seen yeah. the local post office up here you know he's got them on the counter and mm -hmm. it isn't because we're down the road it's just he would got them out there when we moved in everyone just kind of loves it and I think everyone kind of feels part of that Family. grenade story yeah. to the point that and I think they kind of got a bit fed up of and this isn't just in our industry, but just bigger brands mm -hmm. having it their own way for years. You've seen all the disruption in the drinks industry of just craft beers that have come along, tonics that have come along. And I think a lot of the the bigger, more established multinationals just kind of got lazy. Yeah. And it happens in business. How's um, How does your dad treat you now? Is he proud of you? Because I'm he proud of you, he, brother. I'm oh, for you, my He man. can't take it in. Do you know yeah. what? Now, I actually don't tell him. Because nah. he can't take it in. Mm -hmm. So... And it kind of frustrates me a bit. You kind of want to cuddle the pat on the back to say, I'm proud of you. It's kind of, no matter what we do in life, yeah. we kind of want that, no acceptance, but we kind of want the exposure from your family to say, uh, it's weird how you, yeah. I think anyway, but just that I'm proud of you moment from family members is, is, is as gold, as good as gold with anything. He, he would say it, and I don't need that from him, because my dad's actually, I know what you're thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm adopted, my dad's actually quite shy. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, because dad was so shy, mm -hmm. I, I saw that as 
really holding him back. Mm-hmm. And and I when I was 14, 15, I was pretty shy until I went to the gym. And you can't be shy when you're 15 and you're in a gym full of 25 mm-hmm. year old bodybuilders because they take the piss. So you either kind of suck it up and give it back. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, that's about just developing your personality and, and kind of giving as good as you get because everyone nowadays is wrapped up in fucking cotton wool. Yeah. And you see it over the TV, you got to keep telling, you know, telling people what to do that people can't think for themselves there's yeah. no common sense so with my dad if I say like, I love you dad he'd, he'd always say I love you back but I, if I tell him I mean you can imagine from my dad you know I've sent him pictures and there's me and Richard uh, and whatever and I tell you actually once dad was in hospital about three years ago and he went in for, he had prostate cancer so he went in and uh, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll come down and see you. And I'd got my pilot's license at this point and I got a plane. So I flew down to Bournemouth to go and send my old man in hospital. And it, it absolutely made his day, not just seeing me. He, he, was, he didn't want me to kind of take time up my day to go and see him, mm-hmm. which is crazy. But that's just, yeah, yeah. yeah, in that respect. What made his day was in the hospital, in Bournemouth Hospital, in WH Smith, there was a big grenade display and a big banner outside and my sister walked in and took a picture and showed my dad. And he's mm-hmm. like, you know, it's in the hospital he's in and, and in a big way, not just a bar at the till, but like a whole big uh, display unit outside. Yeah. And I showed him a picture of our new warehouse and there were, that kind of, he's a visual guy. So, cause he was a head of goods vehicle mechanic, you could show him a warehouse and he'd, he'd kind of get it. And, and now we've had like, we're our sixth warehouse and in mm-hmm. our warehouse, there's four or 5,000 pallets, you know, 14, 15 million in stock. Um, and I showed him pictures and this, this, it panned the warehouse and he saw, you know, we started this business from home. So the mm. warehouse was my garage at home, my single story garage. And I show him then a warehouse that's hundreds of thousands of square feet with 50 mm-hmm. warehouse staff and, um, just about rows and rows and rows of product. And, you know, four or five articulated lorry loads of bars turning up mm-hmm. weekly you know in and out in and out and we still can't get enough and i think you show him that and he's like oh bloody hell <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's all he says he's like you can't believe it uh-huh. you know he, so he's super proud yeah but he wouldn't really say that sure to as me much. People are no, like that not really. shy. he's kind yeah, of yeah, shy yeah. he doesn't he yeah. doesn't say a lot but you've noticed and, that now and it's because as a kid you probably didn't see that but then as you go older yeah. you realize probably his parents were like that or, or you've passed down from generation to generation and you know what i've organized so much stuff for him and mm. i did last week actually and but he'd never ring me and tell me he enjoyed it or yeah, how yeah, it yeah. went i have to kind of ring him see it went i mean 77 now yeah, yeah, yeah. but last week i got him a private tour of hms victory mm-hmm. just through a donation to like a military charity i uh, i won't say who it is but i took him on father's day into a specific special forces base by helicopter um to to meet you know just some absolute legends of of, of the british fighting forces and had photos there like you know by the mod and he's got photos of the day and mm-hmm. um uh, you know met you know, current serving members of our special forces and he just doesn't say anything. He's kind of, he's just such a a quiet guy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it would kind of sink in. I took him, uh, last year I flew him to, he'd always wanted to see the Normandy beaches. So I flew down to Bournemouth, picked him up from Bournemouth, flew to Caen, showed him around the Normandy beaches. I got a tour guide who was 80, whose dad was in the French resistance. She showed us around for the day. She took a liking to me, so I was fucking lucky to get away with her without being uh, <laughs> molested. Um, and, um, and took him more on the Normandy beaches uh-huh. by someone whose dad was there. Mm-hmm. And again, he didn't say a lot. And I, <laughs> and I, I flew home. Um, and, uh, I, I, uh, and, and just all sorts of just crazy kind of money can't buy stuff. Yeah, yeah. And... I mean, I was on the front cover of a magazine the other week and I sort of, I, I didn't show him that because mm-hmm. I don't think he can kind of take take it in. Yeah. Uh, and I've kind of stopped giving them newspaper articles and clippings because they've yeah. got like a big pile and I just, I don't mm-hmm. want to keep going like, oh, there's more stuff. Oh, <laughs> I mean, we're in the paper again, mom. Because she kind of gets it. Yeah, so there's yeah, no yeah. point just keep on doing stuff like that. But I flew him out to, because um, uh, my dad's really into military stuff. That's where mm-hmm. I get it from. And I took him out to uh, see a, uh, a friend I've met over the last few years called Bruce Crompton, who's got the TV show Combat Dealers. So I took him over to Bruce's place and we flew in and we had a day looking. Bruce supplied all the vehicles for the film Fury and for Saving Private Ryan. So we have a look around all this and it's completely private. So we, we show him around all the, we do some shooting and on and off tanks and in and out of tanks and I've taken him tank driving. And again, he doesn't say a lot, mm-hmm. but I said to my uh, I said to my wife the 
the, the other week actually I'm going to stop getting stuff for dad because I don't <laughs> I don't know if he actually appreciates any of, any of this or, or but do, do, do you know what I've learned as well if I just went down to see him and give him a hug he'd like that just as much yeah, I don't yeah, actually yeah. need to do mm-hmm. I need to do some of the wacky stuff yeah as much as I appreciate just going for a walk on a cold yeah. day in the woods and having a mm-hmm. coffee which is nice and it's nice to go and stay on Necker yeah. and do nice stuff. To me, they're kind of the mm-hmm. same thing. But fair play for not forgetting your roots, brother. And that's what makes you, I think, separates you from... There are, there are a lot of people I've interviewed, you're, you're different because you're a gentleman, you're a good guy. And you, oh, thank you're you. Fucking, I, I'm rooting for you as well. And I'm proud of you, man, because what you've achieved, it's a rag to riches story. No yeah. matter what way you look at it, and you're an inspiration for people to see it can be done. Well, so, pe- people like the underdogs, don't they? Yeah, people man, like the underdogs. And, and I, I always look for underdog. I'm an underdog, so nobody thought I would get to where I am from my background. But yeah. it goes to show that... I've been listening to the podcast. Yeah, it's, yeah. Very, it's very inspirational. And again, yeah. you can listen to this stuff and you can always take something from it mm-hmm. just by learning from mistakes. And everyone, everyone's got words of wisdom. They might not know it, but if you can extract those words of wisdom yeah. from them and you're brilliant at it... Um, it, it, it's it's incredibly it's incredibly powerful yeah. stuff and like i said we're, we're just kind of enjoying the journey yeah. and as well i say to the guys the team here if i'm being a knob you got to tell me and i, I say that a lot to people mm-hmm. uh, and they would they just it's say you, they just say you're though. being a yeah they say you're being a dick yeah it's good vibes everybody seems to be happy at their work and people walking around talking it's not like yeah. it's closed off don't speak fucking get your head in the computer oh no 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 i, I want to see people uh, yeah, working hard. I want to see people laughing. Yeah. If we're looking around, because all that humour and personality finds its way into the products. If people are laughing when they're mm. writing copy, it's good. Yeah. And if they think it's good, mm-hmm. consumers will think it's good. Yeah. And it's all about putting your personality mm-hmm. into a brand. And everyone's brand they've created is an extension of that founder's mm-hmm. personality. Yeah. You know, if you create Red Bull, he was he's into he was into Formula One, so he gravitates towards Formula yeah. One. Do what you enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can do what you enjoy and you're good mm-hmm. at it. And you, you need to have, I don't believe in luck, but you need to, timing's important. You have to become a master of timing because if we'd done this 10 years ago, it wouldn't have worked. Mm-hmm. Maybe 10 is in the future, it wouldn't have worked. You have to kind of do something that works in the period that you're yeah. in now. And I do see people kind of, like, like you know, a, a moth at a window kind of bash away at stuff sometimes and, and it isn't going to work. And you have to balance that mm-hmm. with the tenacity of making things that work, that's not a chance of working. Yeah. Um, and you have to kind of understand that mm-hmm. fairly quickly, I think, with business. So what's your day-to-day routine then? What's an entrepreneur's day-to-day routine? What, what oh, time do you go? You're a 5 a.m. kind of guy? Or no, I'm not. I'm, I, I'm the opposite. I'm a go-to-bed-late mm-hmm. kind of guy. Um, Working though at night? Uh, well, funnily enough, I'm kind of more of a night owl, which is why years ago it was better for me to work the doors because I was naturally kind of quite good at staying mm-hmm. awake. Um I've, I've never been really good at getting up in, in the morning. I've tried to train myself to do that, to get the most out of the day, um, and by training first thing. And if you if you can do it and kind of make it effective and make it a morning person, um, it, it works. But genuinely, you need routine for that. And I don't really have routine. I've got no two days the same. Uh, we've got Guinness World Records in today because yeah, we've, yeah, we've, um, we've, we've, we've done a world record yeah, protein yeah, bar. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah. Um, um, well, it's just, again, every day, every day is different. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, we've we've made the world's largest protein bar. So it's uh, it's 320 kilos, I think, something like that. It's about two meters long. Uh, we've just got some lifting straps in to help us lift it. It's uh, about 80 kilograms of protein, and it's just short of a million calories. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're going to be uh, giving that to some military friends, probably the Royal Marines, and actually. And this is the Guinness World Record? Yeah, 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 for the world's largest protein bar. Uh, that's um, unbelievable. That's yeah. amazing. Congratulations on that. Uh, so that's today. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow I'm doing a podcast. in. Uh, it's number one in the Middle East, and it's it's, it's big one in the US. Mm-hmm. I've got that. But generally, yeah, I, I, I kind of... I get up when I wake up. It's broadly about six o'clock in the morning, about five past six, something like that. First thing is pick up my phone, go through all the messages overnight from what's happened in the US and, mm-hmm. and overseas. So do that when I'm having a coffee. Um, generally, I'm in the office. I've got about an hour's commute. So I kind of line up a few podcasts, line up some phone calls. Uh, I may or may not train at home. Uh, but yeah, coming to work and then it's whatever the day throws at us. Yeah. We've always kind of got a certain level of meetings booked in. Um, but then I just kind of, I like to just have flexibility to go mm. wherever the day takes me. And then broadly I leave here probably about six-ish, I'm home for about seven. Um, and again, I might train, hot tub, um, go in a sauna or something. I've got got some stuff at home, so I kind of try and relax a bit at home. But generally I'm, I'm just, I'm glued to my phone. Do you meditate or anything, night. breathing exercises, I don't, no, nothing I don't, like I, that? Do you know what? I've actually have arranged for a breathing guy called Richie Bostock. He's called mm. the breath guy to come in and, and actually do a talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, I need to do that sort of stuff. 
but I'm kind of too stressed out and too time precious to do and it. That'll but help you though. Yeah, it will. Yeah. And, and to be fair, all my friends telling me you need yeah. to do the breathing you exercises. Don't breathe enough. So if yeah. you don't breathe enough, what happens is there's not enough oxygen going to the brain. This is yeah. where anxiety, yeah. overworking, stressful. Yeah. We do a lot of cold water exposure. We go up the mountains, jump on okay. ice, cold yeah, yeah, waters, yeah. a lot of Wim Hof stuff where, where the breathing techniques are so much benefits through cold water from the, the endorphins but it releases which is a chemical also fight I've started to have more yeah. cold showers really definitely good just yeah, yeah 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 no I get that and actually it really goes off of stuff like MS in terms of diet cold showers yeah. um, and breathing mm -hmm. as well really big for things like MS but um, which I've got a few friends but they're, they're saying the same yeah. you, you've got to get into the, the meditation definitely. it does kind of feel a bit a bit wanky in some respects but I get it I've got to try and find a way where I can slot it into exactly the same point for me every week you know the same day the same time mm -hmm. so i know to yeah. do it then it's that regimental stuff but consistency is key yeah it is yeah, yeah. and kind of and, and and where i've got bad habits make good habits yeah but again you can do your 10 minutes anything but the more you do it the more it becomes natural if you do it in the car yeah, I take yeah. It, you probably can so before we finish up brother the future plans give me it okay so this all sounds a bit shit but i guess it's kind of more of the same um, we are broadly, as this industry grows, we're about 75% of it. So if we're not growing, the industry's not growing. Um, we've got, if we are having a moment in time, I want to make sure we make the most of it. So what I don't want to do is look back 10, 15, 20 years from now and go, you blew that. You didn't do it. You should have done this. You should have done that. So if I think of it, we're doing it basically. Um, really important, surround myself with brilliant, creative people. And you touched on this earlier, whether they're multimillionaires or they've been men, I like being around nice people. I don't care what they've got. I don't care where they've come from. I don't care, you know, I do care where they're going. If they go in the wrong place, I don't want to be around them. I don't want that negativity. But I want to surround myself with people I like, and I trust and I respect. Um, and I want to build a, an amazing business that's iconic, that stands the test of time. That, you know, if I don't have kids, this will be my baby. And I can mm. look back and go, do you know what? I started that with nothing. I built it. We did this. We did that. I went all around the world. I'm amazing people. And most of all, we had fun. I want to mm. keep having fun. Mm -hmm. um, Crashing so, planes, fucking... Well, we, we went from planes then to tanks, so driving mm -hmm. tanks around. But my thing for this year is I've, we've made a grenade hot air balloon. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll show you a picture afterwards. You can probably put it on the screen for your podcast. Yeah, well. But uh, it's, a, it's a custom hot air, but it's being built now. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a giant grenade, and we're going to fly that around for a bit. So where well, we can't afford to go and take over various sporting yeah. events, we're just going to float the hot air balloon past mm -hmm. them. There'll be no one there at events this year, because we'll, we'll all be dead from coronavirus. <laughs> so. like, if, if you competition, Alan, because you, you seem to be blown everybody out of the water. Uh, I mean, we do, but I think our next competitor is probably about a quarter of the size that we are, mm. and it's a very different brand. Um, and again, not knocking anyone. A lot of people do copy what we do and imitate what we do, but Grenade's just got this personality, which is an extension of all the people that create it, which is the people in this building. And I don't know what we're doing next week necessarily, so no one else knows what we're doing next week mm -hmm. until we do it. We do get a lot of imitation, but every time they imitate us, it just helps us. Mm -hmm. And I think because... You know, I'm founder and still here driving forward. A lot of the other businesses now, the founders aren't there. They're gone. They've cashed out. They've burnt out. So I'm quite conscious now that a lot of our, all of our competitors are now pretty much owned by um, sort of private multinationals. Mm. They've they've mostly sold out. You know, Hershey bought some. Um, uh, who else? Uh, who else has been bought out? Yeah, American brands have, have bought them out, and the. The founders have gone, whether they were kind of pushed out or just didn't want to do it anymore. You know, it's kind of their prerogative. But I still feel like we've got a lot of energy left to go and do amazing things. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make the most of it. The trick is then, you know, at what point do I kind of think enough's enough and then change my life? As, we, as you know, we've gone full circle. We started the podcast. How do I change my life and think, OK, enough's enough. I'm now going to go and have some real me time and I'm going to travel the world and, and find myself, for mm -hmm. instance. But I think I know who I am. Yeah. Um, Listen, if and you're happy, been, who says, yeah, exactly, you yeah, 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 fucking yeah, change it. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, Happiness it, is yeah, key, man. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you know what? I've always been happy. When I was a kid and I was at school and I was like six and um, and I left junior school and I, on my last day, like, you know, the teachers kind of sign your book and I specifically remember the headmaster wrote in my book, Keep Smiling, because mm -hmm. I just always, and, and it was weird because I fucking hated school. So why I went around <laughs> smiling is beyond me. Uh -huh. But I just think, again, even if, even if I don't like something, I'll try and make the most of it. Yeah. Um, in that sense. That's but the best thing is you can make the most out of any situation that you can take positives for any situation, no matter how dark, no matter how happy. 
like you say, somebody gave you 210 quid and somebody moaned about that. Oh, and I should have gave you more. Yeah. That's people like that, but that is in 97% of the world that fails. And I believe this is why it's easy to become more successful because so many people are weak. The yeah. cotton wool that you speak about, everybody's scared to take risks and chances. Yeah, they and are. And the majority of my guests, people told me not to get them on. I was not bad yeah. from every TV station. It's not good enough. Every documentary, it's not good enough. I kept chatting away. They're on Amazon. It's gone on Netflix. Yeah, I've seen it. It's yeah, one it's of the fantastic. biggest. It's one yeah, of the biggest podcasts fantastic. in the UK. So for me, fuck everybody else. And these same yeah. people who knock me back, I'd want to work with me now, but yeah. I've got too much pride and ego that I don't want to speak <laughs> to them. I, 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 do you know what? I get that. You take it personally. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I think where it's individuals and people, mm-hmm. you should kind of be the bigger man and have them. I'm on. trying to do that stuff for me because that. That you're going around all those petrol stations and what. Yeah, they knocked you back, but you've still got the minutes. So for me, yeah, I feel as yeah. if you never gave me a fucking chance at the start. So why should I work with you now? Because your figures are dropping. You need me to pick up your figures. Do you know what I won't do? So when we first started with Grenade, and lots of people helped us, and lots of people didn't. The people that didn't help us were the people that didn't know us, where it was just, say, for instance, the guys that were going to provide, the guys that provided the grenade bottle, amazing, bent over backwards for us for nothing and took a risk on us. So we're still with them 10 years later and I'll be with them forever. The guys who were providing the boxes, the corrugated boxes, they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to quote. They didn't want the works. We weren't big enough. And that wasn't a personal thing. That was a business decision. And I get it. Why would they take a risk on... Uh, why would they take a risk on, um, uh, you know, on Alan and Juliet Barra? Mm. So again, we found like local box suppliers who would take a risk on us, and they're the guys we're still with. Now every week, the bigger companies come back, and now they want the work. Yeah. Well, why should they get the work now? Because mm-hmm. they didn't want the work. Before. So how do I work so, on that, Alan? Then how do what do I do? Because I know d- the work said it's going to enhance my stock and it's going to open other doors. But for me, I've still got pride where. You didn't you, take a risk on me at the start. Yeah, you have to. You've got to be the bigger man. And I think you have to. I, I'm a big fan of humility. And I think mm-hmm. this is why I like surrounding myself with lots of people in the military who have got a lot of humility. And uh, yeah, you've got to, you've got to show the humility mm-hmm. and be the bigger man. And yeah, not kind of resent them for yeah. not wanting to come on when it was a small channel. Because yeah. that, was that a bad decision for them? No, you know, not no, really. Of no, it wasn't. but I get what the facts. But, but but you take that mm-hmm. personally because yeah. it's you and your brand. Yeah. But it's nothing personal against yeah. you. So you have to. Otherwise, if you're not careful, you'll start to. And this kind of comes with success. You uh-huh. don't want that to turn into arrogance. Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't do that. But I just felt as if. Because I told them what I was going to do and I proved it. My actions spoke louder than words, but nobody would take the risk. People did take the risk and I still contact with them day, planning for other things the next two and three years, which yeah. I'll do. But right now, they want to work and I feel as if, fuck them. But I know deep inside it's still going to open doors. That's yeah. something that I know I'm going to work on. You've, yeah, for I'm, anyone I'm, that's saying, sorry, two minutes, for anybody that's want to be an entrepreneur, that's want to work hard, what advice would you give for them, Alan? I mean, they've, you've got to just do it. And mm-hmm. I'm getting my team outside the door now because I've got the Guinness World Records. Yeah. I want to take some pictures so we're mm-hmm. getting pushed for time. But you've got to and avoid all the people, unless it is an utterly ridiculous idea. And I can't think of any examples <laughs> off the top of my head. But um, avoid all the people that say, don't do it. If you believe in it, that's all that matters. Every day I get people message me going, I've got this idea. Should I do it? Well, why are you asking me? You're the one that's got to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, they're looking for that confidence someone to tell me it's a good idea if you don't think it's a good idea or you don't know it's a good idea then it probably isn't a good idea i always thought grenade was a good idea whether it was or everyone agreed or not they didn't need to jules was the same you know she thought it was a good idea and we try it what's the worst that can happen Mm. you'll fail so what no one's died if you don't and i'm going to steal actually i'm going to steal rob's quote from from yesterday if you don't um, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Yeah. And it's actually quite nice. Who's got anywhere by taking risks? Yeah. You've taken massive risks. Yeah. You know, so manage the downside. Clearly, it's different if you're starting a business when you're 20 versus when you're 70. Mm-hmm. So you need to allow time to recover. Jules and I had no kids, so it was easier for us because we only had two adults to mm-hmm. think about and we were okay with it. If you've got two kids or small kids, it's different because if you fuck it up, you know, you're, you're, you're hurting them. Yeah. So maybe that was easier for us to make that decision. But also we sacrificed a lot. You know, we, we didn't have kids because we were working. It wasn't a priority. We didn't have time mm-hmm. and it would have been a distraction for us. So where we've never been ruthless with people or margins or money, we were kind of ruthless with ourselves and our time. Mm-hmm. But no, we, 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 we can't do kids. Um, 
just because we want to build this brand and that's going to get in the way. So I was mm-hmm. kind of ruthless in that way, but only with my myself, yeah. only with ourselves. Alan, listen, I thoroughly enjoyed this, brother. You're a Likewise, great, yeah. cheers, thank you. Listen, you're a great man and I can't wait to see you. I'll be rooting for you in the future, no matter what you really do. Really pretty. No, um, thanks for coming out no, your listen, way as well. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you. God bless, brother.